So uh, welcome. Um, uh, it's, it's really exciting to have so many people here. Um, I, it, it's likely that numbers will grow as the, the morning progresses, um, and that's fine. The, it's clearly been interesting times, but we, we did all manage to meet up in December. Um, and again, I think that was a really successful meeting. The feedback from that event was people quite enjoyed just listening and hearing about what was, was happening and what was going on. Um, and we, we're basically going to replicate that particular formula. Um, so you're going to hear a number of presentations on what we've done since the last meeting, what we're doing at the moment and what we're hoping uh, to achieve. And that's going to be interspersed with a number of more specific kind of little mini lectures on projects that are further in development or we're planning to do. We have already had some, the, the need to maybe have some slight alterations, um, but we will deal with that as, as we uh, approach them. Um, but I, I would just like to kind of, uh, and I, I'm sure I will keep this at the end, but, but thank you very much for everyone's continued uh, commitment and uh, persistence in responding to uh, Peruki studies or Peruki questionnaires. It's always hugely appreciated. We maintain our record as probably being one of the most responsive organizations in the PERN international network. And certainly, as, as we will highlight later on, that the magnesium sulfate uh, study, again, I think we're the, the uh, the, the leading PERN site in terms of uh, respondents, which, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, we appreciate that things ha clearly haven't been easy, um, but uh, again, as we'll go on to saying, for, for things like the Bronx Bronc Start study, there is so much enthusiasm to get back to doing research. Um, I have no doubt that as we kind of move forward, we will continue to, to recruit, perhaps even in excess of some of the, the stuff that we've done in the past. Um, it's been a, um, a, a year of change a bit in terms of the, the executive structure. Um, what I'd like to do now is just take a, a quick chance uh, to, to welcome uh, Michael Barrett. Um, he is, is probably well known to a lot of you and has been a, a leading light in PEM research in Ireland for some time. Um, I am guilty as, as, <laughs> as much as anyone of forgetting that it is Peruki Paediatric Emergency Research, United Kingdom and Ireland and was originally set up to be. <coughs> um, and the executive committee have, have made a decision to, to invite Michael to be part of the executive. It's probably something we should have done a, a while ago. But that enables Michael to be kind of part of discussions that we're having at ve very early stages. Uh, as you're aware, I'm sure that there are different ethical and research governance arrangements in Ireland. And it's just to make sure that when we do move forward in studies, that we're doing that as, as equitably uh, as possible. Um, so uh, welcome, uh, Michael, to the team. Um, and, and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from your expertise. Um, and then uh, as the, the programme highlights that we will be announcing new uh, vice chairs and, and chairs uh, as the meeting progresses. So um, just for those who are, are, are joining, it, it will be good if you can have probably your, your video, video turned off and muted. Uh, we're going to work through a number of presentations during the course of the, the morning. Please, can you put your name, uh, title and affiliation in the chat? That's just so we can kind of record your presence and it enables you to perhaps chat to each other behind the scenes. Um, it would be good, uh, uh, and I'd, I'd be happy to see discussions going on as presentations are taking place. Uh, if you've got questions um, so that we can address those questions and please, please do ask questions of each other in the chat. These are always really good learning experiences, uh, research, clinical uh, or otherwise. Um, so without further ado, I think we should uh, make a start. Um, so I'm going to uh, hand you on um, uh, for the first presentation of the day. Uh, and this is going to be about what we've done. Um, and I see this coming up, fantastic. Um, so over to you, Michael. Uh, thanks very much, Damien, for that uh, introduction. 
So in this presentation, um, we're going to go over the Peruki publication since June uh, 2020. So um, the one of the COVID related publications was this publication, um, COVID-19 Emergency Response Assessment Study or the SARA study, um, a prospective longitudinal survey of frontline doctors. And um, this was led at the front by Tom Roberts uh, from the TURN network and also was a huge collaborative study with emergency medicine, anesthetics, intensive care medicine, trainee networks and Peruki. Um, and um, this was the protocol which led on to um, a further two publications. And the aims of it was uh, to describe the evolving and cumulative effects of working during the phase of the COVID-19 pandemic on doctors' psychological well-being, um, people working at the front line. And um, the surveys were matched to the different phases that you see there um, in a pandemic. So the acceleration phase, peak phase, and deceleration phase. And of course, we've had numerous uh, waves of the pandemic since, which resulted in an extension of study. The primary outcomes are were psychological distress, post-trauma stress by the general health questionnaire, and impact of event scaled revised. The first publication um, resulted in um, 5,177 respondents and the breakdown between the speciality groups were the majority came from emergency medicine closely followed then by anesthetics and intensive care medicine. And for the primary outcome of the GHQ 12 score, 44% uh, of respondents scored greater than three, meeting the criteria for psychological. So the findings indicated that during the acceleration phase of COVID-19 pandemic, almost half of frontline doctors working in acute care reported psychological distress as measured by the GHQ 12. A more recent publication, again, related to this, uh, was in the British Journal of Asia. And this study reports the rates of psychological distress and trauma of frontline doctors working in those speciality groups uh, during January 2021. Um, in total, um, there was a drop off from the original response rate. But in total, there was um, 1,719 participants that responded all the surveys and the rates of distress and trauma during January 2021 are the highest they have been during the pandemic. Um, there's a significant cohort of doctors who continue to experience high levels of distress and trauma throughout every phase of the pandemic and the prevalence of psychological trauma was higher in January compared to the peak of the first response. Another COVID related publication uh, led by Silvia Bresson in uh, Italy, um, in collaboration with the uh, Reprem network, uh, was the preparedness and response to pediatric COVID-19 in European Emergency Department, a collaborative study between Reprem and Peruki. And it goes to describe the variability and identify gaps in the preparedness and response to coronavirus in the pandemic in European EDs. Um, 102 centres responded from 18 countries, another phenomenal response rate at 86%, and 34% did not have an ED contingency plan for pandemics, 36% never simulated for such events, and 25% uh, reported having a corona disease 2019 positive ED staff. <laughs> um, now we discuss a few studies led by Tom Waterfield, and they really are an excellent demonstration on how one might go about building a body of evidence on a research topic. So in the Lancet uh, Infectious Diseases in April 2021, I'm sure you're all familiar with the PIC study now, validating clinical practice guidelines for the management of children with non-blanching rashes uh, in the UK. This is a prospective multi-center cohort study um, across um, 37 UK uh, Peruki sites and uh, the inclusion criteria were if children were under 18 years of age with fever and non-blanching rash 
um, that were not suffering from uh, a known hematological condition or HSP. And this resulted in 1,300 patients, um, over 1,300 patients being analyzed. And um, what they identified is that the current NIS <sighs> guidelines perform poorly when compared with tailored clinical practice guidelines. And these findings suggest that the UK national guidance could be improved by shifting towards a more tailored approach. And what might this more tailored approach be? Well, it could involve loop-mediated loop isothermic amplification for the early diagnosis of invasive meningococcal disease in children. Again, another paper led by Tom Waterfield, um, which goes on to describe rapid molecular diagnostic testing has the potential to improve the early recognition of meningococcal disease. So this involves a throat swab with a one hour turnaround time. Uh, this was a comparative prospective study across three EDs in November 2017 through to um, June 2019. And this was compared against culture or PCR from a sterile body site um, for meningococcal disease. Again, similar inclusion criteria to the last um, 18 years, under 18 years of age with features of meningococcal, um, excluding known uh, conditions that may cause petechiae or active hemlock hen shinlock purpura. And um, they screened 304 patients, 263 were analyzed, um, index positive tests, so a lamp positive test in 14, three had an invalid index test, and 246 cases had index text test negative. Just five patients had um, meningococcal disease. So the lamp test proved highly sensitive and specific for the identification of invasive meningococcal disease. So further research uh, to fully ascertain the best use of the lamp testing within the diagnostic pathway is required. Uh, potential uses could be as an adjuvant to blood culture and PCR techniques to rapidly identify those kids with likely meningococcal disease and then to tailor the antimicrobial therapy. It's been suggested that procalcitonin may be superior to C-reactive peptide for the diagnosis of um, a serious bacteria infection in children. And with that in mind, uh, there was this study also led by Tom, which is the diagnostic test accuracy of point of care procalcitonin to diagnose serious bacterial in infections in children. So it compares the diagnostic test accuracy of CRP and procalcitonin for the diagnosis of serious bacterial infection. Again, perspective data collection from four, from four EDs and the inclusion and uh, exclusion criteria are now quite familiar. Um, both CRP and procalcitonin demonstrated an area under the curve um, of 0 0.7. So there was no difference in the performance of procalcitonin and CRP for the recognition of serious bacterial infection amongst febrile children attending the ED. So this data suggests that in low prevalence settings such as REDs, that the indiscriminate use of procalcitonin and CRP in febrile children is of limited value. Um, these uh, findings should be interpreted with caution. They're not applicable to higher serious bacterial infection prevalence settings such as inpatients or intensive care, cases of pneumonia or infants under three months of age. Um, so procalcitonin and CRP have a moderate accuracy for the detecting serious bacterial infection when used indiscriminately in the ED uh, febrile children. So this study is the Pediatric Acute Asthma Scoring Systems, a systematic uh, review which is nicely paired with a survey of UK practice. So the systematic review identified in articles uh, which detailed out 17 pediatric asthma scores, involved 15 parameters. Um, there was a median of six parameters uh, in these scores, but the range was between two and eight. Um, and the parameters involved include all the ones you'd anticipate with asthma, 
And the best validated ones were the pulmonary index score, PEED asthma severity score, childhood asthma score, and the PRAM score. Um, then 20 out of uh, 59 sites used a score to assess severity. Um, and they were the parameters used at each of those sites. Um, and all parameters were used um, in just six sites for the pulmonary pulmonary index score, and three sites for the pediatric asthma severity score. So standardized published pediatric asthma severity scores are infrequently used. Um, improved routine data collection focusing on key parameters common to multiple scores could improve this, facilitate research and audit of pediatric acute asthma. The respondents were asked to um, prioritize uh, features of the pediatric asthma severity score that they would utilize. And um, what they stated was number, number one, um, that it should predict safe discharge from the ED. It should be fully validated in kids. It should uh, collect routine data. It should predict HDU stroke ICU admission, uh, predict ward admission. There should be minimal involved. Um, it could, could be used in published papers going forward, and it can be automatically generated by electronic health records. This study um, is a survey of uh, mobile health use from a physician perspective in pediatric emergency care in the UK and Ireland, uh, led, led by uh, Heiko and also Damien as the lead author. Um, and it provides a snapshot of current apps, instant messaging, and smartphone photography used in pediatric emergency care. Again, a web-based self-report questionnaire, which received 189 completed responses. So, so what's new and what did it tell us? Um, so there was widespread use in the absence of alternatives. And the BNF was nearly universally downloaded to physicians' um, personal mobile phones. One third used instant messaging and smartphone photography on their personal mobile device when seeking patient management advice from other teams in the absence of alternatives. The article also goes into more depth about the, the usage of these uh, devices under emergent themes such as security, data governance, and device type. And um, this study, uh, again, with the, the same authorship this time, the senior author was Mark Little, um, was describing the emergency, a perukie survey of prescribing and resuscitation aids. Um, 46 out of 54 perukie sites responded, 198 physicians completed the individual survey and uh, described the use of paper-based electronic prescribing resuscitation aids in pediatric emergency care. So the use of formulary apps in routine emergency prescribing is now nearly as widespread as the use of more traditional tools. Record. However, this was not the case for resuscitation applications and it's unclear what the obstacles to digital healthcare culture are with regards to the use of pediatric resuscitation apps. Uh, Max Lafferty um, and senior author Niall Mullen published this, which is the ingestion of meta um, metallic foreign bodies, um, a survey of current practice and handheld metal detector usage. So 55% uh, of sites used a handheld metal device. There was um, training in 10% of sites and there was considerable variation in the management um, of uh, the findings when a coin, when a um, foreign body was found in the esophagus. There was also variability in area scanned, the anatomical cutoff and decision-making. Um, and uh, the, the closing question on this study was, do we need greater evidence to increase the numbers of practitioners who use observation as a first line? The um, need for recovery amongst emergency physicians in the UK and Ireland, a cross-sectional study. Uh, first author was Laura Cotty, 
um, and um, it's a cross-sectional <laughs> electronic survey um, across emergency departments in the UK and Ireland, and a phenomenal response with 112 uh, there. Um, to the, it, and it's to determine for recovery amongst emergency physicians and to identify uh, demographic and occupational characteristics associated with a higher NFR score. So the NFR score, um, what is there to say about it? Um, well, uh, for emergency medicine workers, um, higher NFR scores were observed amongst emergency physicians than reported in any other professional or population to date. So um, really high scores for um, emergency medicine workers. And um, the lower need for recovery scores were associated with the following. So some non-modifiable features, consultant grade, male gender, no long-term health condition or disability, or working in PEDS emergency medicine only, which is great, delighted about that. Tick, tick, tick. Um, and the modifiable ones are good access to annual leave, good access to study leave, and lower proportion of out of hours work. Really important study um, on health at work and need for recovery. Um, some publications hot off the press. So um, the structures of pediatric pain management, a Peruki service evaluation study led by Sheena Dernan. Um, and senior author um, uh, Stuart Hartshorn. So it goes on to describe the structures. So the physical and organizational characteristics for health occur um, as they affect process measures, which affect outcome measures. So the aim of the study was to describe system structures to manage acute pain and presenting to EDs. And um, this was part of the feasibility study um, for the MAGPIE trial all those years ago. Um, it's a really busy, busy slide, um, but um, to um, explain it a little, green is good, red is bad, um, and when we look across all the respondents, we see quite an amount of red and amber, which um, um, are hard evidence that there's many sites um, across the UK and Ireland which um, don't um, have um, excellently detailed clinical practice guidelines um, with respect to pediatric pain. So the finding of this study was despite national guidance and, and recommendations from multiple audits, there are substantial variations in structures um, for the dealing of pediatric pain. And the lack of uniformity is likely the root cause for the persistent suboptimal practice identified by serial national audits. Um, this study was by Louise Roper and um, senior author was Kerry Wuffel, um, all related to the Eclipse trial. Um, this was published in the EMJ and it was um, a study within a study, which is absolutely excellent to see demonstrated. Um, a mixed methods embedded study, consent study in all 30 UK sites, which enrolled patients into the Eclipse trial qualitative uh, methods to explore how practitioners describe the trial and research without pre-consent by audio recording recruitment discussions and assessing how well this information was understood by interviewing parents with, uh, within a month of the recruitment discussion. So um, ultimately, um, when aggregated together and analyzed, and the, the quality of uh, information provided a seven step framework to optimize consent discussions and uh, parental understanding in pediatric emergency and critical care. So this is really useful for sites wanting to be involved in drug trials with respect to emergent care um, and how you might go about um, uh, the, those discussions around consent and parental understanding of, uh, of the trial. Um, um, a partner study, which was also done um, by uh, senior author Kerry Wuffel within the um, uh, Eclipse trial was exploring parent and practitioner experiences of recruitment, um, consent and um, or the lack of consent and conduct of the trial to inform the design and conduct of future ED trials. Again, the 30 UK sites which enrolled patients in between 
July 2015 and April 2017. And this study provides valuable insight from uh, parents and practitioners to inform the design and conduct of future trials in this setting, uh, including consideration of how the study and the recruitment without pre-consent could be briefly communicated to parents of children who are regular ED attenders at the point of randomization, if that's appropriate. Um, this study, which was um, the, the senior author was Stephen Mullen um, out of Belfast, um, which is a really interesting study. Um, the mortality in adolescent trauma, a comparison of children's mixed and adult major trauma centers. So current data from English major trauma center demonstrated a lower crude and adjusted mortality rate for adolescent trauma patients attending a children's major trauma center. And this association persists in cases of severe trauma. So an ISS of greater than 15, and there was no difference in the length of stay between major trauma center types. So children's mixed or adult, although variation existed in CT rates and time from arrival to CT. Another study hot off the press um, with Damien, the senior author, um, and a collaborative study between uh, Gapruki and Peruki, an um, electronic survey which uh, looked at the point of care testing in pediatric settings in the UK and Ireland. Um, and it demonstrates significant consensus in point of care practice in the UK and Ireland, but highlights specific inequity in new, newer bio biomarkers. Some do not have support from national guidance. So there is a need for a clear strategy to overcome the key obstacles of funding, evidence base, standardize, standardizing variation um, will be essential if there is a drive towards increasing um, implementation of point of care testing. Um, I've been firing a lot of studies at you, um, but just I think two more to go, and these all relate to the Pediatric Emergency Research Network, the global organization under which uh, we um, uh, collaborate uh, with our sister research organizations across the world. So this is a study with senior uh, author Simon Craig based out of Australia, and it's um, looking at the exposure and confidence across critical airway procedures in pediatric emergency medicine and international survey study. Um, and it's a web-based survey of senior emergency physicians um, and was distributed through the, through the six research networks associated with CARN and just published um, in April 2015. Its aim to determine the frequency with which EM physicians perform pediatric uh, airway procedures, BMV, ET intubation, lar laryngeal air mask insertion, tracheostomy tube, tube change, and surgical airways, and to investigate the predictors of procedural confidence regarding um, advanced airway management and um, unsurprisingly, uh, BMV and ET tube insertion were most commonly performed pediatric airway procedures by EM physicians and surgical airways are infrequent. Um, supervising airway procedures may serve to maintain procedural confidence for physicians despite infrequent opportunities as the primary procedure lists. Um, and last but not least um, is this uh, review article which was published in Pediatric Emergency Care um, by all of the, the senior research network authors um, across all the research networks across the globe. Um, the first author was Terry Klassen um, from Canada and a uh, senior author was Nathan Cooperman um, from North America. Um, the Pediatric Emergency Network was launched in 2009 the PERN successes with global research um, were measured in this article by um, detailing out prospective observational and interventional studies. Um, the network can now move to improve its ability to promote implementation of scientific advances into everyday clinical practice. And um, they aim to achieve this goal um, by focusing on four areas, expanding the capacity for global randomized controlled trials, deepening the focus on implementation science, um, increasing attention to healthcare disparities and their origins with growing momentum towards equity, 
and expanding mm -hmm. Fern's global reach through the addition of sites and networks from resource restricted regions. Okay, Gaurav Mila Mahagwiv, um, thanks a million. And thanks for all your hard work and support for all of these research projects because they would not happen without you. Um, back to you, Damien. Wow, uh, amazing work, uh, Michael. Thank you for keeping that at pace and on time as well. Because uh, I, I suspect if you had done all of those studies justice, we, we probably would have been here until tomorrow. So, so thank you for your succinct summaries. Um, and it really is an amazing uh, achievement. Um, I, I mean, that's just the work that we've had published, not the work that we've, we've done or got coming up. Um, so a, a, a brilliant volume of evidence. Um, any questions in the chat? I haven't seen anything so far and, and there may not be, um, but I'll, I'll just hang fire for five, 10 seconds or so, just in case anyone wanted any clarification um, of, of anything that Michael has been talking about. Um, okay, so next thing to, to ask is whether um, we have uh, Rob Forsyth on the call yet, uh, and we yeah. do, yeah. brilliant. Um, Rob, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change the, the program around just because, um, so are you ready to go now? I can be. Brilliant, fantastic. Um, so uh, I'm going to hand over to, to Rob Forsyth, who, as you may or may not be aware, has been leading on the Crescent study. This has been more to Peruki, but it continues to move forward. Um, it, it, it's it really exciting um, and, and a great development as we move forward from the, the RCT of Eclipse. Um, so uh, Rob, over to you. Uh, great, thanks, Damien. Uh... Uh, I'll attempt to share my screen. Hang on a second. Can everyone see that? It's looking good for me. Yeah. So yeah, just um, thanks again, Damien, for the uh, and Niall for the invitation uh, to bring an update to this meeting. Um, and just for those of you who don't know me, I'm a, I'm a pediatric neurologist. So I sit in my ivory tower uh, here in Newcastle. Um, and I just wanted to say, it's been a real uh, privilege to, to sort of uh, get to know uh, some of the folk in Peruki and to work up this uh, grant application with you. Um, this uh, grant proposal was initially uh, pitched uh, at a Peruki meeting um, in, uh, London uh, just two years ago, I think, uh, this month, uh, although it feels a very long two years ago. Um, uh, and I, for those who weren't there, I'm just going to give a little bit of an update. But progress has really been very uh, rapid. And I think in large part, that's because of uh, the credibility uh, of Peruki as, as a research delivery uh, um, organization, and particularly uh, the 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 uh, success of Eclipse. So uh, we are looking at uh, this new trial, which we've dubbed Crescent, which again is a trial in uh, pediatric convulsive status epilepticus. Uh, but unlike Eclipse, which was, as you uh, I'm sure recall, uh, a trial of an open label trial of second line treatments, uh, this is looking at the first line treatment of convulsive status, and particularly uh, um, hypothesizing that pH manipulation may have a role in uh, control of seizure onset and seizure termination. I won't go through all the science this time. I did that uh, two years ago. I'm very happy to expand on that if people uh, want me to. Uh, but yeah, there's reasonable evidence that alkalosis promotes seizure onset and that the acidosis that develops both a respiratory and a metabolic acidosis that develops during convulsive status epilepticus may actually be part of the, the sort of natural mechanism of seizure termination. So we're, we're asking whether we can uh, 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 utilize that um, by uh, <clears throat> uh, manipulating pH during a seizure. So again, just 
recapping what's been really very rapid progress for this. The, so the, the proposal was initially brought to the meeting in 2019. Um, uh, we applied to the EME program of NAHR, which some people may be slightly less familiar with. It's one of the more upstream um, developmental funding schemes that EME, uh, sorry, that NIHR offers. So it's it's for a first in human uh, study. Um, and although our timelines were somewhat COVID delayed, uh, we got confirmation of funding uh, this time last year. Um, and <clears throat> it's, intended to be a very uh, pragmatic, double-blind RCT. So unlike Eclipse, which was open label, this is double-blind. Um, <clears throat> again, drawing on Eclipse, we're using a deferred consent model. And the design is really very much uh, inspired by Eclipse, although the follow-up regime is, is uh, simpler. And we are using uh, this slightly novel approach. Uh, so this is a randomized control trial of a medical gas, which um, is a slightly unusual thing, um, and has you know is causing not in, uh, insoluble but novel problems for us in terms of getting it through uh, ethics and MHRA and so on. But we're using uh, this mixture, which is a commercially produced gas mixture. BOC produced this uh, gas. It's actually used in some radiotherapy protocols, and uh, it used to be used in um, ophthalmology for treating uh, retinal uh, vein inclusion, I think. But anyway, it's a, it's a commercially available uh, gas mixture. And as you can see, it's 95% oxygen, 5% CO2. So you've got the concentration of CO2 that you'd have in uh, exhaled air. Um, so it's really a fairly physiological uh, 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 intervention. Uh, my slide seems to have jammed at this point, hang on. Yeah, not quite sure what's happened here. My slides have jammed. Oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> and so we're trying to keep this incredibly simple, mindful that basically children have to be enrolled into this trial uh, you know, within seconds of coming through the front door. So it's really any child under 16 presenting in status that the uh, you know, uh, attending physician thinks needs APLS uh, first line treatment either by APLS or if, if, if it's one of these uh, regular attenders who have their own treatment regimes, well, then that regime. But so it's whatever their standard uh, first line uh, uh, CSE management is, uh, whilst either inhaling 100% oxygen or uh, this 5% carbogen mixture. The only uh, exclusion that we want is known previous enrollment. Um, we, we do acknowledge that unintended re-enrollment re may occur. So for example, a child might be brought in from school, uh, you know, and, and previous enrollment in the trial might, uh, not, might not be known at the time. Uh, so that might occur, but they, those children will be excluded from analysis. Uh, but we will be encouraging parents, uh, if they're enrolled to make sure that if they represent, uh, they make the attending team know that, uh, um, uh, uh, this child's already been enrolled and that will be the only planned exclusion. We are having a conversation around known or suspected pregnancy. Um, given that this trial uh, involves no um, sort of external uh, molecule, no, no sort of uh, extrinsic molecule, we are fairly optimistic that we'll be able to remove that uh, need to think about that uh, as a trial consideration. And we will be using a pre-randomization design, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So when we're not asking people to open envelopes um, uh, in resus, <clears throat> as I say, the intervention is standard APLS management uh, whilst inhaling either 5% carbogen at 15 liters a minute or 100% oxygen uh, at 15 liters a minute uh, for uh, the first 10 minutes uh, on admission. And it's from a blinded uh, gas cylinder. Um, and these are consecutively numbered in a predefined sequence. So the idea is that uh, you, you basically, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, after 10 minutes, if you deem that the child still needs supplemental oxygen, 
new switch to the hospital pipe to oxygen supply. So it's just the first 10 minutes of, of, of presentation. So we're trying to keep this really quite straightforward. Um, this is a mock-up of the cylinder. It will be uh, a CD size cylinder. So those are pretty uh, easy to carry around. They're three and a half kilos when full. Uh, it's, uh, I think you'll be familiar with the CD cylinder. It has an integral uh, valve on the top. Uh, as I say, it, it will be uh, overpainted, and, and so you'll be blinded to the cylinder content. Um, and the idea is that these are supplied to uh, EDs in batches sequentially numbered. And so after the enrollment of uh, one child, the next uh, cylinder in the sequence is uh, brought to ED uh, in anticipation of the next arrival. So you, that's what I mean by pre-randomization. You shouldn't have to do anything other than to open the valve on the cylinder that's already sitting in your recess area um, when the child presents. Outcomes, uh, again, very similar to uh, Eclipse, except that here, obviously, we're primarily interested in the success of first-line treatment, did not require second-line uh, uh, medication. And we have various secondary endpoints, which, again, are very similar to Eclipse. And then we have a defined secondary analysis, we, we, uh, a predefined secondary analysis. We uh, think this business of alkalosis and seizure determination, uh, seizure precipitation might be particularly relevant uh, uh, in febrile convulsion. Uh, and so we'll be asking people to retrospectively determine whether they thought this uh, was a febrile CSE. Uh, and we'll be looking at as a defined subgroup in the analysis. And where available um, from uh, blood gases taken in um, ED, uh, we will be doing some secondary analyses looking at the pH and whether that pre uh, predicts response to uh, carbogen. Um, and just in terms of timelines, uh, so everything obviously has been very COVID delayed, but we are due to officially launch on the 1st of October uh, with a six month setup phase, pushing through ethics and so on. And we're start hoping to open our first sites next March uh, and planning basically to open a site per month through next spring. Um, with a, uh, a potential for recruitment of 24 months we, we have got an interim analysis by the external uh, DMEC at 12 months, uh, which will be a go, no go uh, decision. So this reflects the fact that, uh, again, this, this funding scheme, the EME funding scheme uh, is very used to uh, uh, you know, very exploratory trials and they're quite keen to have early decisions as to whether to continue into a, sec you know, uh, a second year of recruitment or not. So we will have this uh, interim analysis. <clears throat> but if we do the full uh, trial over two years, um, our target recruitment is just over 400 children. Um, of course, because this is a trial of first line treatment, um, uh, at least uh, one in f uh, the compared to Eclipse, our recruitment rate should be four to five times faster. Um, and if we look at the eight best recruiting sites to Eclipse, uh, we think that you know, if we open one site per month, uh, we should be recruiting sufficiently by month 10 across eight sites, but we potentially uh, will uh, open up up to 12 sites for contingencies. So we don't need to necessarily dominate the entire uh, ED uh, uh, community, but we've, uh, as, as folks should be aware, we've already put out a, um, uh, a feasibility questionnaire. And again, I've been hugely encouraged by the response we've had. Thank you to everybody who has expressed interest in the trial. Uh, we've got an embarrassment of riches in terms of very well qualified uh, sites who uh, are keen to be part of the study. So we will be looking at those and, and approaching sites uh, in the next six months. Um, in terms of known unknowns, um, I guess the biggest question for us at the moment uh, in terms of threats to the trial you know, with every passing year, um, I think community services and families become more familiar and more confident with the use of first line uh, treatment in the community. Uh, and you know, there's a sense that perhaps uh, the presentation rates of children still actively convulsing when they arrive in ED is drifting down over time. 
Uh, so our rates may be lower even than Eclipse, you know, even though that's a still a, a relatively recent data set. Um, a lot of children in, who present in compulsive status, of course, are presenting for the first time, um, and you know, that won't apply to those children. The one, uh, the other thing that we know is a potential recruitment threat is that the, the possibility of a child being discharged home very rapidly, e.g. directly home from ED. Uh, I think that's unlikely, uh, but, but it will, I mean, it, it will be uncommon, but it will happen. Um, and one of the changes, unfortunately, since Eclipse ran is that GDPR is now here. And it's clear from talking to people who know more about these things than, than I do that in Eclipse, uh, as you may recall, those who um, uh, were discharged home before people had a chance to uh, get consent in the hospital, um, they were sent a written uh, information sheet and asked to consent in writing, and, and there were reminders sent out, uh, but uh, non-responses were eventually regarded uh, you know, that that data was included in Eclipse. Uh, our advice is that we can't do that now with GDPR, uh, that we'll only be able to use data with explicit consent, so we can't rely on a sort of uh, uh, opt-in model there. So we're going to lose some follow-up data there. Uh, the, that's that's unavoidable, I think. Um, but I think that's all I've got in terms of um, uh, slides. So I'm very happy to take uh, questions and um, yeah, whatever would be a useful use of the next few minutes. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, I mean, that's really useful. Lovely to see this progressing. Really chuffed that we can use some of the data from Eclipse to uh, uh, give really good rationales for the reasons for, the, for this study. I mean, j just from a, my kind of boogie standpoint, it's really nice to see that development because uh, it really adds to the, the weight of the work that this network does. Um, again, I haven't seen any any specific questions in the chat bar. Um, Again, I'll hold people who might not have access to the chat if you just wanted to call out if there are any questions for Rob directly. Okay, Rob, one question I did have, and sorry if I had a temporary amnesia during the... The sites haven't been selected yet, is that right? That's correct. We've, we've had expressions of interest from about 20 sites. Um, and you know, a lot of them are very credible looking um, uh, submissions, but uh, uh, we haven't actually formally approached sites to, to pin things down, but we've had a lot of interest. Okay, cool. And what's your time scale for doing that? So it'll be this autumn. The, the, uh, the, uh, it's the Liverpool CTU again, as, as with Eclipse. Um, they've been slightly resource constrained over the summer. They, they are just appointing uh, the trial manager now. Um, so we will be getting going. Uh, probably uh, we'll um, sort of pick up that conversation um, in September, October, I think. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that uh, update, uh, Rob. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I will leave it to it. Um, I, I think the fact that there aren't questions is, is a real testament to the effort that you and your team have put into explaining this study, which again, I, I keep saying, I, I was not convinced that this was going to get to this stage when you first pitched it to me, and I eat a lot of humble pie because you've done brilliant work, and I'm now really excited about this. So, so thank you very much. Yeah, I, thank you, and again, just thanks for the opportunity to work with Baruki. It's, I'm, I'm really enjoying it, and uh, yeah. Um, it's great. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Rob. Right. Um, so, uh, according to, I, I just switched things around. Um, okay, I was hoping both uh, participants will be here, but they, they don't seem to be, but I'm gonna make the announcement anyway. Um, so uh, I have now been chair of Peruki for well over for, for three years. Um, I have picked up a few other kind of jobs along the way. Um, and 
acknowledging the immense amount of work that the original executive put into forming uh, Peruki, in particular, uh, Mark Little and, and also Stuart Hartshorn, who really provided a platform, I think, for the next three years to grow rapidly from a uh, just a, a provisional network that was producing small amounts of studies to one now that is producing and is part of large RCTs. Uh, and I think, as you've just heard, some really innovative work. Um, that the time is to the time has come to, to move on and continue to generate capacity and interest within the Peruki exec. Um, so in our latest newsletter, we went out for expressions of interest for a chair and vice chair. Um, and I am absolutely delighted to inform you uh, that we are going to have Nar Mullin as the new chair of Peruki and Dr. Thomas Waterfield as the, the vice chair. Um, if we can do a virtual applause for them, um, uh, that would be great. Um, I would really like to um, uh, kind of just, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased about, about these uh, appointments. Um, I'm really uh, happy to be handing on, um, and, uh, but, and I don't do that with a heavy heart. I will be part of the Peruki exec because I'm going to stay on as a committee facilitator. There is now so much work to be done that we need the exec to be bigger and more responsive than it is. And in part of that, that's one of the reasons we'd invited um, Michael uh, to, to join us. Um, but I think the future is really bright. What we have uh, in now and Tom, really proactive, very engaged individuals. Um, and we, we have an exec, which I think is in a really good place to, to move us forward. Um, be, be, because of the, the, the challenges of the role, I'm going to be in a transitional role with Niall probably for the next six months, maybe up to a year in a kind of a co-chair capacity, uh, just to make sure that the transition is as smooth as possible. Um, uh, but, but, it, but this is great news for uh, Peruki. Um, so, as we, we move forward, uh, please do keep uh, an eye out for newsletters and interests that committee members uh, will come and go over time, and we really are keen to appeal to as a diverse um, group of people as possible, uh, because that's what's going to keep us kind of in touch with some of the challenges that you all face um, on the shop floor. Okie dokie. So that's that announcement. We didn't crescent. Is Chris Bird on the call? Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> hi, Damien. I'm here. Chris, can I invite you then? Have you got a presentation? I do. Yeah, just a couple of slides if that's okay. Yeah, shall I share? Fine. So Chris is going to give a travel fever update. Over to you, Chris. Thanks very much. Uh, just two seconds while I get the slides. <laughs> Okay, oops. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh. Can everyone see that? Yeah, I, I've got it. You might want to make it full screen. Yeah. Okay, got um, so um, Damien and everyone, thank you very, very much for, for giving me a couple of minutes to talk about this study, which um, some of you might be scratching your heads and thinking, gosh, is that still going? We heard about this years ago. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges that we've had. Um, but um, and I'm not sure if um, Vanessa, uh, Vanessa Merrick at St Mary's is on the line, but she's also, um, um, as a London PI, she, um, she's been working really hard on this study too. Um, so the, the original question was, is a rapid diagnostic test, uh, which had been around for years, um, enough to rule out malaria in children presenting to the ED uh, with a tropical travel history and fever? And, and, the, and, and, and the reason I, I wanted to look at this is that um, in, in, in many tropical settings, um, RDTs are used alone um, to screen for malaria. Um, but, um, but we still uh, insist in the UK on a, uh, and in many other countries on a, on a film, uh, which takes a long time, uh, means our patients are waiting quite a long time um, in the ED for results. And there's also debate and confusion um, sometimes about how many films we actually need to do. Um, and a pilot 
study that we did at, at Birmingham Children's in 2015 suggested that an RDT probably alone probably was safe, um, but it was underpowered. So the idea of the study was to um, uh, use, use the Periki network um, to get the numbers um, to see um, if we could use an RDT alone. Uh, and, and the idea being um, that wouldn't it be wonderful if, if we had one of these kits in triage um, uh, to, to rule out malaria there and then. And we got HRA study approval um, in June 2020. There have been some issues. The reason, one of the reasons it's taken so long is that um, we, we took a while to sort of work out um, what this study actually was. And we originally um, thought that this was um, uh, just a service evaluation and audit, uh, but we kept getting pushed back from, from um, um, R&D centers to say, no, this was research. And so we had to go through the whole, um, uh, uh, we, had, we had to go through the whole process of, um, of gaining um, HRA approval. Uh, and uh, while I thought this could be done fairly, um, fairly, fairly quickly with, with, with sort of minimum effort, I've learned a lot on the way um, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, there's been an, an enormous amount of work um, uh, um, through R&D departments and um, getting all the right paperwork and green lights and all these other things um, that were originally um, 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 some of us thought were, um, had, uh, wasn't necessary. And um, if anyone um, is thinking of doing a similar sort of retrospective study, which they think is small and fairly straightforward, don't hesitate to contact me um, and I'll be able to, to let you know about um, some, um, uh, um, some of the issues. Um, which uh, which which are um, uh, loomed a little larger than I thought they than I thought they might. Uh, then the things slightly ground to a halt uh, for completely understandable reasons with the pandemic, and I guess that's going to be a theme throughout the morning. Um, uh, and we actually um, four of um, four of the sites had to withdraw because they were too busy with um, uh, with pandemic studies. Um, and I, I see that Michael uh, Michael Barrett's on the call, and, and it would be good to catch up uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, as soon as possible. But um, uh, Michael very kindly um, months ago um, got the data ready for the study, um, but we've been unable to accept it um, while our R and D uh, research department try and work out how we share data um, now that we've left the European Union. Deep sigh. So what this study that has shown is, is, um, is incredible power of the Peruki network. Um, and this being a low, so it's, it's a common, it's a common uh, theme when you look at the research um, uh, priorities um, for, for different ED networks um, globally, which is what do you do with a, with a high stakes but low numbers diagnosis, uh, which malaria is one. And to power this study, we needed it, um, uh, uh, around 1,200 um, uh, 1, patients. Um, of the 21 sites um, left in the study, 14 have already submitted data, and we've got a fantastic 988 patients um, so far, and we just need just over 200 more, uh, and very much hoping that Edinburgh, Lewisham, Whittington, and Northwick Park will be able to um, submit soon. Um, uh, and so that's um, so, and, and we got this just because of the the pandemic. Uh, we got a, an amendment um, keeping the study open. Uh, for data submission up until the end of September. So the main thing really is to say a massive thank you to all these people um, who in their own free time have, um, uh, have put this data together. And, um, and while I can't talk about, the, uh, talk about the, the, the initial data that we've looked at, uh, all I can say is I think it's looking extremely promising that hopefully we, it will be, um, we, we will be able to discharge kids from the ED um, with an RDT alone. Um, but really, really, um, and, and please contact me if, if you think anyone, if, if anyone's watching and, I, and you think I've missed their name, please, please let me know. But um, um, all these people, thank you so, so much um, for sticking with this study. We're nearly there. Many thanks, Damien. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. I mean, it's, it's really good to see that that coming along and you, you're so close to, to getting over the, 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 the finish line. Um, are there any questions? Um, oh, so, so we've got something uh, from Ruth here. Chris, how many of your sites required an R&D study setup fee? Um, it's not something that I've been particularly cognizant of. Uh, we weren't, we, um, uh, so far, we haven't been asked for one. I think there was one site, Imperial, um, that, that, that was asking about a setup fee, uh, but we, we kind of sorted that. But I think going, if anyone was thinking of going forward with one of these studies, I think you would now have to budget for that 
um, for, for, for R and D time um, uh, and, and also um, sort of re re research nurse time. I think I don't think I could ever do this study again. I, I think it would need you'd need a proper grant and funding to do it. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. So I see Mark's got his hand up, but I'll just uh, I'll go to Shrook's question in the chat first. Has a lack of international travel affected the study numbers, and will you look at this in your study? Brilliant question, and a total piece of luck is that we wanted we got data from 2016 to 2017, so two years of data then when people were still travelling. And yes, because the we I think the study would have completely sunk um, if we tried to to recruit to, to get data from them um, during the pandemic. Although we, we, we did have a couple of malaria cases at Birmingham um, recently. People are still traveling. Oh, interesting. Um, Mark. So I was just reflecting on what Chris said um, about the whole working through the HRA and things like that. And, and this is one of those studies where I think as a network, we saw the landscape shift under our feet more than once, not just with COVID. Um, when we started Puruki, this is the type of thing that we would have managed to just push through as a service evaluation in the past. The lead site for the study would have reviewed it within r and &I. They would have provided a letter that said, yep, this is service evaluation. And we would have shared it with all the r and I's across the network and everybody would have said, that's okay, that's fine. And the HRA framework was introduced a few years back now, which was designed to make things easier, um, but unfortunately has the question in it, is this generalizable? And as soon as you tick that box, your study becomes research. And so every multi-center service evaluation that we would have done in the past or do in the future became research because of the generalizability, because you got lots of sites taking part. So I think that Chris certainly and I know I've had lots of conversations with you, Chris, through the through the last couple of years, you know, and, and your your hairline has probably receded as much as mine has in the time because, you know, th this is one of those this is one of those elements which really increased the burden, and I think we need to be cognizant of as a network. There is no such thing, really, I think, as a, a quick and dirty service evaluation anymore. Whenever we're using the power of the network, which is so great in generating the numbers. But the downside is that it creates a lot more research governance for us. We've seen that with dimples as well. Uh, and I know that Rude has experience with, with episodes and other studies, which are all using retrospective, routinely collected data, but still now fall under that umbrella of research. And I think that that creates its own challenges, but creates its own opportunities as well. So, you know, kind of obviously with being a virtual conference this time around, time is a little bit tight, uh, but certainly in future meetings, the plan, I think, Damien, tell me if I'm wrong, but the plan is for Chris and Caroline, the CI of Dimples, plus Heidi, the, the uh, sponsor representative in Berkshire for Dimples. We're hoping to get them on to say, look, you know, this is, this is the journey of the studies. This is what we had to go through in terms of the approval this is how you uh, generate the local information pack. This is how you communicate with PIs. This is how you communicate with uh, research departments. These are all the things that you have to think through and record that as you know, kind of some video resources and written resources for everybody out there who's going to try and do a study like this in the future. Um, because this is really, really important work uh, and will help us answer really, really important questions, but will take more time for whoever is leading the study. The, the, mid, the biggest disaster for me with this study would not be that it's under powered or anything else. It's, it would be that we don't capture the learning from it in terms of the processes, uh, because I think that as a network, this is a sign of our increasing maturity. Um, and I know that Niall and Tom will be on this when they come on to the executive as well, uh, but making sure that we share those across the network, whether it's this retrospective data type thing or making sure that we're above board with surveys, everything else where the landscape, landscape shifts every so often, we need to be right on the cutting edge of it. Um, and I think that's massively important with all this work. Chris, do you agree? 
Yeah, no, thanks. You, you put it much more eloquently than I ever could. Um, um, but yes, I completely agree. And um, and I think um, and I think it would be really um, um, to, to crack on actually quite uh, as early as possible to, to give that um, uh, um, to give that overview of how to get one of these studies through, um, because it's um, it, it's it is actually quite straightforward. But because it's because of, because the territory because the ground has shifted, I spent a lot of time asking people who didn't really know, who, who didn't know the answer for very good reasons. Um, and so, if you are thinking of one of these studies, um, do do contact us um, uh, because we can save you a lot of time. Brilliant, thank you, Chris. Um, could I ask you to stop sharing your screen? Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, and just to reiterate some of the discussion there about learning, which is, is critical. Um, just we're waiting, we're a bit ahead of time, which is, which is nice. And we're just waiting for Richard Chin to, to join us. Um, just on this comment though, about the, the mechanisms of some of these studies, uh, some of the good news that I should have probably shared at the introduction, is that Peruki have recently become a non-commercial partner of the NIHR. Um, what that means in practice is that studies that we support and fund are now allowed to go directly onto the portfolio. Um, and if you can imagine, uh, if you are kind of a research team member yourself, or you work closely with your research teams, that that is a game changer in some of our observational work, which previously required on a lot of goodwill. Um, but, if, but if we now, um, but, sorry, in practice, what it means now is studies that we previously completely required on goodwill for, we can now move forward with, with the reassurance that if the Peruki exec approve uh, the funding of this and what will happen for these studies is that for re the research steering committee will do the job that they've always done people will submit a study uh, we will look at it but on a, a form or you will say that you're interested in this being a, a funded Peruki study that get, gets portfolio adoption um, the executive will liaise with APEM, the Association of Pediatric Emergency Medicine, because they will hopefully be providing us with some money to provide the tangible funding. NIHR want to see money exchange hands, um, and so that they will have some involvement in this as well as the, the, the overall kind of funding body. Um, but this will enable a couple of studies per year to be adopted on the portfolio. Um, and, and I think that that will again as i said be a game changer if you go onto the peruki website at the moment uh you will find that there is a new tab uh it's called funding it explains a bit of the background and shows the process and the plan would be is that we will have two calls a year for specifically peruki funded studies now what, what, what I don't really want to happen is everyone assume that, that the funding is something that you have to get because one, the, lots of the, the big NIHR, other studies are already funded, they're already on the portfolio, that, that is not the route uh, to, to ask Peruki for, for further monies. And that there are still some questionnaire survey stuff that really is done by staff members and again, doesn't need uh, recruitment or accrual. Uh, what we're really looking at is studies which do involve consent usually, or maybe deferred consent or derogated consent um, and require a lot of data collection. We, we have such a large patient base that our, our prospective observational capacity is massive. And we've already proved that. Pick a game changer published in the Lancet series and will really, I think, inform practice going forward. Uh, and when I discuss Bronx Star, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be doing the same. Um, so um, I think uh, this is just, this is it's great news. It's really great news for Peruki that has happened. Um, and, and please do have a look at the website. Mark, is, is Richard on? Oh, Richard, I'll ask you, is, are you on? Uh, he was trying to join five minutes ago. Okay. Would you, did you want to just give a bit of the, the context to why we've asked Richard to, to join us uh, and, and, and talk about a bit of the, the Eclipse journey up to this point? 
Sure. Nothing like being put on the spot. Okay. I'm no, always feeling fine. adequate after I having watched. Uh, <laughs> after having watched Dr. Roland and Dr. Magnus pop up on television several times over the last couple of weeks, it's always slightly intimidating. So, so I can see Richard is, has now been able to join. There he is. There, it's great to have him on board. As everybody remembers, like you know, kind of the first big Peruki RCT we did was Eclipse which explored lots of different things, didn't it? Not just the question as to whether or not levetiracetam or phenytoin might be more effective, but explored whether we could actually do research in our emergency department, do research in resus, use research without prior consent, add to the methodology, add to the evidence base for the treatment. And of course, one of the big targets, I guess, when we set out as Peruki was to foster that growth in research, but also try and translate the research findings into practice. And we're now starting to see that journey come full circle, where we're about to see the translation of research into practice, but also the raising of more questions. So in previous meetings and today, we've talked about Crescent. We've still got the uh, earlier place for levetiracetam study, which we're developing and we're not going to talk about today. So those are the new questions that, that we've already figured out, we know, but now that we're translating into guidelines and, and into everyday clinical work, we're starting to see more and more questions come out all the time. And that's really, I guess, the context for Richard, who's joining us from Edinburgh. He's a professor of neurology, uh, paediatric neurology in, in Edinburgh Children's and University. And um, he's been involved in the guideline updates through the APLS side of things. There are concurrent updates happening elsewhere as well. Um, and it has led to the generation of many, many phone calls, I think, between Rich and myself and longer email streams than I would care to mention uh, across a wider group. Uh, it also fits in really nicely, and I know that um, this may come up later on, it fits in really nicely with some of the survey work that we did, oh, going back, what, five months ago now, just to find what people were using in their departments following the publication of Eclipse, which I know is being um, further developed. So Richard, I'll shut up at that point and uh, leave it to you to talk for the next little while. Let me know if there's anything you want me to chip in on. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, I view this very much as a collaboration, really, and uh, I'm very pleased and very thankful to be given an opportunity to, to address this uh, August group. Um, uh, perhaps it's best if I just share my screen. Uh, let's see. Right, is that okay? Can can you see that? Uh, I'm not hearing anything. Mark, if you can. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Right. So, as Mark mentioned, um, you know, a lot of the work um, has is coming to fruition. I thought I'd, I'd just give you an update from the APLS and British Pediatric Neurology um, standpoint. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about the guidelines and the relation to, to NICE um, is another area that's being um, uh, updated. And the salient proposed changes, obviously what I'm going to um, share with you is confidential, it's not yet official. And so please, um, no sharing and, uh, and keep it to yourselves for the time being. And, uh, and timelines uh, for introduction of this guideline, I, I think is going to be quite important. And then finally, just um, talk about, about uh, uh, an audit and a surveillance proposal that um, we, we would like to, to um, uh, put to this group and, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to work on this together. And it's similar to the Patika and Children and Bronco Start um, studies, which I, I know have um, Mark uh, has shared has been ongoing or has already been completed. So <clears throat> um, on the background of the Eclipse and, and the CONCEPT trial and also the ESET trial uh, in the States, there is a, was a strong desire to revise the, 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 the guidelines, but also there's been some work showing um, that you know, there has been a delay in treatment. Mark touched on you know, giving levetiracetam a bit earlier. So there was this whole question about, um, you know, should we really um, be trying to give things a bit earlier? And also, you know, is benzodiazepines the best uh, first line treatment? And you've already heard um, about the, the consult trial, which is ongoing. So um, the British Pediatric Neurology Association came together with the, um, uh, the ALS group um, to try to revise the guidelines. And we were um, trying to link with the NICE group, but the NICE group um, 
and wanted to be very, very um, objective about it and uh, trying to stick to the, the, the rules of, of it. So there was no discussions um, that has taken place with the NICE group, except to say that they don't want to collaborate at this point. So NICE is currently also doing an update, um, which is going to be independent of this altogether. Uh, in terms of timelines, um, this uh, APLS BPNA guidelines uh, will is, is virtually finished and the plan is for it to be published in um, a, a very soon uh, in, in the ALSG manuals as well as in the BPNA guidelines and hopefully in archives and disease and practice and guidelines as well. And it's, you know, multidisciplinary involvement, ER physicians, pediatric intensivists, uh, general pediatricians, pharmacists, and epilepsy nurse specialists, as well as neurologists. I have to emphasize uh, that it's not solely evidence-based and a lot of expert opinion and personal opinion is in this and, and that's reflected in the guidelines. Um, and uh, what we hope to do is that once it's published, hopefully that will be in the public domain and NICE will take that on board because what we don't want is, um, is conflicting uh, guidelines. <clears throat> uh, you know, there's been this long-standing view that longer duration is associated with a worse outcome. And, and that's the, the reason that, you know, there's this emergency. But we've already known anecdotally and in published studies that there are delays between doses of anti-seizure medications. But some work that my group has done and other groups have done have shown that in children who have established status, so they've reached 30 minutes of seizure activity, that actually there was no worse outcome if it was 30 minutes, 60 minutes, or 90 minutes. But this is in a context of children who are having intervention and um, they've all um, you know, reached to that uh, 30 minute mark. Um, we know that if there's delayed treatment <clears throat> after the seizure onset more than 10 minutes, those were um, associated with an increased short-term morbidity problem. So increased risk for death, ITU admission, need for continuous infusions. So <clears throat> I think what this came to was a, a thought about maybe we should aim as before to stop seizures but reaching 30 minutes. So should there be different agents and hence the, the consult trial would the consent trial would be really important from that standpoint. Is there should be a changing in timing. So instead of 10 minutes, should we be looking at five minutes for, for interventions um, in between? <clears throat> um, should there be uh, five minutes in, in between uh, episodes or not? Um, and, and Mark has already mentioned about that. And if you reach 30 minutes, should there be really need to rush in to do immediate um, RSI or not? So two real um, key areas. And this is the framework um, around which the APLS um, guidelines was. So maximum of two doses, which should include pre-hospital treatment. The timing has changed. So in between doses of benzodiazepines and moving from benzodiazepines to levetiracetam, it's going to be shorter. So instead of 10 minutes, it'll be five minutes. So, you know, what Mark was proposing about moving lever to rest them a bit earlier, from a pragmatic point of view, this is actually going to be introduced now without, you know, strong evidence for it. IV lever to rest them, you'll be pleased to hear, will become the default second line. There was some argument about um, being equivalent or equi equivocal to phenytoin or phenobarbitone, but on a pragmatic point of view, the decision was to have IV levetiracetam as a default second line with the others as, as options. And this is the biggest area of uh, public controversy, really. So if the IV levetiracetam fails, you have two options, really. At that point, if the anesthetic team is already, then you should go immediately to <clears throat> early um, RSI. Or if the uh, if the uh, anesthetic team is not ready, then there will be a crossover. So very similar to what was done in, um, in the concept trial. So instead of IV lever triastem, if it fails, then to go to IV phenytoin or phenobarbital. And if that doesn't work, then to have delayed RSI. So either early RSI or delayed RSI. And if it's delayed, to, then to use phenytoin or phenobarbital in the interim. And then another change is to have ketamine as a default RSI agent um, rather than thiopentone or propofol. Um, so this is all um, part of it. So <clears throat> you would have 
picked up by now that, you know, a lot of this is not based on evidence base, a lot of it is personal practice and, and so on. And are we actually doing harm or are we actually doing good? And there are lots of questions here, I think. Um, does it make any difference to the treatment timelines? Is there any reduction in the need for a second line anti-seizure medication? Does it make any difference to seizure duration? And in terms of outcomes, will we see a decrease in admissions to PICU? Will we have any additional side effects of respiratory depression, hypoxia, hypotension? Or with this strategy, is it going to be death? You know, is there going to be an increase in death? Or, you know, all of this has been sort of addressed on a, on a preliminary basis with the concept trial where they're not seeing a lot of this uh, with the crossover design or i.e. a delayed RSI. But we don't know what's happening three months afterwards or six months afterwards. Is there a difference in you know, cognition? Is there a difference in behavior? Is there an additional element there that we, we, we haven't addressed? So I think it's really important that you know, we try to gather this information um, we can't really do it in a trial setting. A lot of the things that we had planned has, has no sort of back to front. So we need to check um, to see um, what's going on from a surveillance standpoint. And if there is still equipoise after we gather that information, we could then think about doing a formal um, set of uh, uh, trials about moving levetiracetam a bit earlier and doing the crossover or even ketamine as a third line agent um, uh, um, before intubation. So um, it's going to be on a, um, uh, similar to the PTK in children's study in Boca Start. It's going to be red cap based. So Mark and I have been working very carefully on that. From a Peruki standpoint, I think it would be vital to have obviously a PI in each center. And the PIs are going to be responsible for helping us and helping you know, us all together to collect live data. So this is you know, data that wouldn't normally be routinely available available such as um, exactly when the seizure started, when did the seizure and the seizure medication start and stop. And also some um, robust hard data such as drug doses and what actual drug choices were used. And then the outcome measures, I think we, it would be useful to um, get some data on this. When we're thinking about the Glasgow Pediatric Extended uh, Outcome Scale, which I think would probably need some clinical input, a market I think would probably need some clinical um, input um, with that, and possibly it would be a really good um, study for maybe trainees um, to be involved with as well. And there's a few final slides um, just to show you, Mark has already been working on um, the REDCap data. Some of this you will have been very um, familiar with in terms of the structure, but this is the kind of live data um, and a bit more of what the sort of delayed data. And then finally, um, just a, a, an example of what the, the follow-up data would look like. So I'm, I'm very happy to, um, and Mark and I, I'm sure will be happy to address any questions or any concerns that you may have. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Richard. Um, so we've got a, there's a couple of questions coming through. Um, wide. Okay, so Dan was just asking about the implications for increasing PIC admissions and asking ED to manage. Uh, what a bit surprised. What? Do, okay, Dan, I'm going to come. I'm going to hold that thought and come back to that. Can we just, so we just got one question. What is the rationale for recommending ketamine for RSI over thio or propopol in the CVS stable patient? Yeah. Um, so I think there was a, a big discussion about this. The feeling was that um, ketamine um, was um, being used widely. Again, um, this is anecdotal. I, I, we didn't have any survey results on this or anything like, like that. Uh, and the thinking was that, um, uh, uh, that ketamine on balance was better than thiopentone or propofol, even although thiopentone and propofol will still be in the guidelines, but if you will, as, as second line treatment or second choice. Okay, I'm, uh, I suspect de depending on what you're used to seeing and doing locally will be depend on how you respond to that particular guidance. 
I mean, I, I've personally got no issues with ketamine, but some of our anaesthetic colleagues do. Uh, and I think it's just <laughs> what you're used to doing. And, and I, I suppose that's a nation of national guidance. You can't um, click yeah. everybody. Um, and, and I think it will be not just a national guidelines because it's going to be in the ALSG guidelines, which is uh, internationally shared. So this is going to be a guideline and, and you know, some places, um, won't have the, the treatment options that we would uh, that are in the guidelines. So yeah, I won't get a hundred percent. Okay, I'm just going to come back to the comment that Dad's made. Uh, Dad's made. Mark, did you want to make any specific comments about the, the audit or the the process that that might work uh, from a Pruki perspective? I seem to hear me. I got kicked out and back in. Okay. Yeah. Mark, I was just about what, what we might do from a Peruki perspective in, 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 in gaining data. In terms of the processes? Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, this is geared up um, as prospective data collection. So it will go through all the usual approval processes. So it'll go through the HRA plus or minus CAG, um, things like that to make sure we can collect the right level of information for families. Um, in terms of how we'll do it, it will follow the same lines as PIC, Bronx, START, all these other, so, you know, even the button battery stuff when it comes online, these other surveillance studies that we are running at the minute, which is essentially what this will be to pick up what is happening with patients, both in the emergency department in terms of treatment, out adverse outcomes and further on down the line. So this will all take place in red cap. Um, people will be able to navigate directly to it. Um, there'll be the option for paper forms as well if folk need them. Data will be absolutely restricted to the bare minimum essential data in the first instance because we know that it's hot, we know that it's live. Um, and what we are using as a framework for that is the Eclipse CRF1 with a, a few extra bits and pieces on there, capturing all the hardwired data, such as what actually happened to the patient afterwards on a second CRF. So the first form would ideally be filled in by clinicians, second form would ideally be filled in by the team, whether that is clinicians, research, nurse with CRN adoption or portfolio adoption uh, and things like that, supporting that. There's then a, a third element to it, which is the follow-up where we need to contact families. And at the minute, Richard and I are just working through some of the outcome tools that we could use. The GOSE looks reasonable in terms of feasibility for length that it takes to do with families. It takes five to 10 minutes, whereas something like the Vineland would take a lot longer. Um, but it is quite clinical in its language, so it's hard to operationalize. If we can find a tool which is both quick to do and easily understood by families, then the plan is to do what we, we've done in the like of the force study and things like that and actually send that by text message. So we've now got REDCap functioning with Twilio behind the scenes so that we can send text messages direct to families in an automated way at a cost of eight pence per text. So it's pretty cheap, it's pretty easy to do, and it's pretty efficient. So depending on what level of funding we can get for this, the idea is to go and, and approach some bodies um, to try and fund at least some administration time, potentially some study time, uh, and to get it onto the portfolio as well to support. So three elements to it. One is the initial clinician, log some very brief data during the seizure episode, and at termination of the seizure episode, number two is done on down the line. 24 hours to a week later and number three is with the families about three months later does that make sense brilliant thank you mark um so th there's been a few comments come through so some good feedback to take back chris from nottingham has highlighted actually sometimes the difficulties of doing red cap live and actually is it easier to do some things on paper like we did on eclipse because you know you've got it there at the, the bedside for some things i think that's worth looking uh take having a thinking about um and yeah paper pad of screaming forms is a good idea uh not always able to access red cap uh, live which is thing now let's go going back to dan and uh, i think uh, someone michelle had made a, a comment 
about could we change practice unintentionally by keeping patients in the ED longer or kind of even creating more churn with our ICU colleagues. Um, and I think um, the, what, what, so Patrick's made a comment about tubing takes a lot of resource, which might be avoided with delayed OSI. Is this data gonna be captured by length of time intubated? Uh, and what I'm thinking off the top of my head is the, um, is how we use this data to demonstrate some of the issues we do have about these children. So I think there's a medical problem here. What is the best agent to treat a child who has status? But there's also a health services issue because what we, what we would have for every emergency department is unlimited anesthetic and ICU resource to really safely manage that patient and wake them up in an appropriate time scale. But we don't. <laughs> so what sometimes happens is that the patient spends hours in ED waiting to go to ICU or that there's a tension between ED and ICU because about where the patient goes. And, and, and being able to describe some of this data I think will actually help potentially in the future with some of the issues that, that Dan's been talking about. Um, and I think getting those timelines and some really clear descriptors about what happens when will be, um, will be important. Uh, and that's Sarah's last comment. So for a DGH, a PICU admission means transfer out to another center, can foresee reluctance to transfer or push to keep an ED longer if, if, there's, if there's earlier tubing. Or, or, um, so, and I know, I think Mark and Richard, you recognize all of these problems and I'm sure you've heard them all before. I, I just think as Peruki as a group, we're just highlighting these are real issues. And I think if we can design something that really understands those, that would be useful. Yeah, I, I, as I said, it's a sort of um, uh, a horse after the cart kind of thing where, you know, ideally this would have had this information before these changes, but the, the guidelines, uh, <laughs> have been um, restructured and they've been revised and uh, and all of these concerns are, are, are concerns that, that, that we share and and uh, for me more importantly you know, you know how it will affect um, the children you know what, what will be the outcome of, of this uh, it's, it's, it's quite concerning i think there is a difference of opinion isn't there between <clears throat> different clinical groups who are under different clinical pressures um, in that while we will be, you know, sometimes aligned with our intensive care colleagues in reducing the need for RSI and intubation, there are then when changes such as this come around, questions that have to be answered across the groups to say, what is the right next thing? Do they go to PICU? Do they stay in ED and get extubated there? And I think that that is going to be really challenging um, going forward and I think that it'll be interesting to see what NICE come out with and it'll be interesting to see what Niall and the team who have run the survey um, come out with and I, I should say having done the Eclipse study I've deliberately stayed out of all guideline conversations as far as possible and haven't been involved in any of the development of them or anything else so everything that comes out the back end is a really nice chance for me to see how others are interpreting the data and it's great I think for, for Richard and others to get this type of stakeholder feedback whenever they're going through that guideline line finalization process uh, I, you know I, I, I'd be really keen to work with Peruki to make sure uh, you know I, as Damon <clears throat> has already mentioned that we're collecting this data <coughs> because I think it will um, impact on um, do we on going forward do we what are the things that need to be changed uh, what's the things that need to be kept Brilliant. Okay. Uh, thank you both. Um, I, I, I think uh, we probably do need to take a break now. What I suggest, kind of, Mark and Richard, some really interesting comments in the chat. Um, I, I wonder probably we, uh, we probably need to get our uh, kind of heads together about bringing back to something to Peruki in, in terms of, of what's going to be collected that, 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 that solves some of the, or doesn't solve, but addresses some of those problems uh, and then take things from there. But thank you very much for, for your hard work. And it's great to see how much a, a previous Peruki study is influencing practice. So th thank and you very much. Damien, just to say on that, the plan from here is to submit a formal proposal uh, once we've got something that hopefully is close to the final data collection so that everybody across the network can chip in um, because it won't work unless we know that everybody's engaged. So we will be very flexible uh, uh, when we listen to what people have to say. 
Fantastic. Okay, we're slightly over, but the, the plan is you've got 10 minutes now to take a bit of a, a, a toilet break, grab a cup of coffee. We will be back at 11.15. Thank you very much to all the speakers who have contributed this morning. Um, I will see you at quarter past 11. Thank you very much, Richard and Mark. That was a SWAT. So it's uh, that was a SWAT, so that was a study within a trial. It wasn't a trial within a trial because a trial within a trial is much ruder. Um, but it was awesome uh, and it was cool. Um, and the recruitment was amazing. So recruitment for force um, was really cool, even when the pandemic struck. So well, I think we were the only other trial to continue and finish recruitment mid pandemic. So we're, we're kind of as good as recovery, which is kind of cool. And our follow up was uh, our follow-up stayed really strong um, throughout, and we ended up with 94% primary outcome at uh, pro uh, three days, which was great. So the fourth study, the monograph, which is the, the kind of final report that goes to HTA, has just gone in. Um, the, the final papers uh, are just about to, to go in, uh, or just about to be circulated around the group. The, the, there was a bit of a, a kerfuffle with health, health, health economics at the end, but it's all done. It's all amazing. It's all cool, and, uh, and we're going to be able to share the results properly um, very formally soon. But moving on. So there's loads more research that needs to be done in children's trauma. Um, and we asked, um, we asked um, uh, BISCOS, so the Children's Orthopaedic Society, we asked the Orthopaedic Trauma Society, and I know some of you guys fed into a Delphi study about the most, the key questions in trauma research. And the number one was about medial epicondyle fractures. So the little lump on the inside of the el elbow, your medial epicondyle, if it breaks off, half the surgeons fix it and half the surgeons don't fix it. So we wrote a trial, which is called the science trial, um, which is my, well, it's, it's my, well, it was my favorite acronym at the time we wrote it, but you'll see at the end, there's a new favorite one. But anyway, um, it was surgery or casts for injuries of the epicondyle in children's elbows. I think that's pretty cool. So that's the science study. Um, it's, so as I say, it's about your lump of bone on the inside of your elbow. Half of people fix it, half of people don't fix it. And there's no rhyme or reason to wait whether surgeons fix it or not. It all depends on how they're feeling, what the weather's like, what they've had for breakfast, whether the football's on. It's just completely random what, what they do. Um, uh, and it doesn't matter how displaced it is. So, so you meet up a condyle will break off and it kind of, it's just a little avulsion fracture. So it kind of just floats around. So one minute you'll take an x-ray and it's a couple of millimeters displaced. The next minute you'll take an x-ray and it's like a centimeter displaced. And one minute you'll do a CT, you'll do an x-ray and it looks completely undisplaced and you'll do a CT and it looks like a centimeter displaced. So, so as long as it's a bit displaced, it doesn't really matter. Um, half people fix it, half people don't. And people argue, some people argue it's better stability and faster mobilization fixing it. Other people say, well, actually, if you fix it, you get long-term pain. There's no real evidence in stability. You need a second operation usually to take the screw out. So it's all a bit random. So the plan is, is surgery better than no surgery? Um, so it's a, a standard superiority tri trial. Um, so multi-center multi, multi -center perspective, randomized superiority trial of operative fixation versus non-operative um, treatment for medial condyle fractures of the humerus in kids. Um, and as I say, it's anything you can display, uh, anything that's displaced on x-ray, because even minimally displaced fractures on CT have up to a centimeter displacement. So this is a completely online trial. It's just as beautiful as FORCE was, um, except even those that, that, that didn't have the, 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 the paper material, uh, the online material, all have it this time. So online randomization, online consent, online questionnaires, online text message, online patient information, and it's great. Um, so do check out the website. It's sciencestudy.org. Um, um, there's, uh, we've just hit 140, which is cool. Uh, we need 332 uh, in order to in order to to complete the trial. So it's been a bit slow. I'll be honest. It's a rare injury. We've got 70 sites in the UK that are open. Um, so pretty much, I think everyone in the Peruki um, uh, in the Peruki network um, is, is pretty much already open. Um, so it's largely orthopedic teams running it, but please, 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 if you see any of these injuries, um, firstly, do alert your orthopedic teams. And secondly, don't let the orthopedic registrar or orthopedic SHO say, oh, this definitely needs to be fixed. Because if we is, we're doomed. Um, but what is really interesting of the, of the 40, 50 people or so that, that have refused to be part of the study at the moment, 45 of them have chosen non-operative care. Um, and that's really interesting to me as a surgeon, because what it says is that people really don't want an operation, 
Whereas we surgeons kind of think, ah, everyone wants fixing. Everyone got know, my scrubs. We I can't. I can't. Talk, we surgeons think everyone wants fixing, but but clearly that's not the case. Um, so that's the science study. Um, um, it's amazing. It's awesome. It's running pretty much everywhere, um, and it's opening at even more centres. And we'll talk about that. Later. The next most exciting study, and perhaps the most exciting study at the moment for you guys, uh, is called the CRAFT study. And the CRAFT study came out of, or came from Evan, uh, and Evan's one of my patients uh, who came with me to a prioritization event at the Royal College of Surgeons. So, so we took Evan and his mum, Philippa, down to the college, um, uh, and it was an NIHR day, uh, all about what the most important research is around trauma. And Evan got a bit smashed to bits, um, and, and he prioritized, or he and his mum, um, put forward the CRAFT study or, the, or, or a, a study about risk fractures uh, as being one that should be prioritized by an art chart. Um, so it's about pediatric risk fractures. Should we or shouldn't we treat them? Um, and you, know, you guys know that this is the CRAFT study. So children's radius acute fracture fixation study. Uh, and this is a beautiful one. So, so we take fractures like this. So a simple Salter-Harris II fracture, a little bit displaced. And this was actually on social media. Uh, and so on social media, some guy put this on LinkedIn. And I quite like stalking people on social media. I stalk some of you guys, it's quite entertaining. Um, and, um, and there was this um, there, there was this distal radius fracture and he put it on and he put it in a cast. Um, and there was a barrage of abuse. And um, people said this fracture will never spontaneously correct. It's too angulated, the damage to the cartilage is done. It's not recoverable. We must abandon the concept that children's fractures always reshape. It's absolutely untrue. And then there was people threatening to report into the GMC and all sorts. It was really, really cool and exciting. Until the next day, he posted this x-ray um, a, a few weeks down the line, how it was just looking kind of beautiful and how it had just kind of remodeled and what was all the fuss about. So, uh, so I thought that was quite funny and quite entertaining. But we kind of know that's the case. And we know it's the case because, look, we take really nasty x-rays like this and we put them in a cast and we wait and we wait. And two years later, they're just better. They're just perfect. They're just amazing. In fact, it takes two years for the x-rays to look like that. But the wrist kind of looks like it straight away and the wrist starts moving straight away and starts moving normally straight away. So it's kind of cool. And we know that because there was a guy in Hawaii, a um, nice place to be. Uh, there's a, a guy in Hawaii who, uh, who instead of went surfing, he was watching all of these distal radius fractures in kids uh, and he, he was treating them non-operatively. Um, and so that's called the Crawford study. It's about overriding distal radius fractures. So that's kind of the basis to the Crawford study. Um, so the Crawford study says, is casting without reduction as good as reduction? Um, so it's a, so a non-inferiority trial. So, we've, so force was an equivalence trial, which, is, which you need the most numbers for. So force was huge. Science is a superiority study. So we're saying, is surgery better than no surgery? And... And uh, CRAFT is a non-inferiority study. So we're saying, is no surgery as good as surgery? Uh, and we're saying it that way because, because sur surgery is the current gold standard, the current, the current treatment, uh, the current standard of care. So CRAFT is also beautiful. It's also entirely online. Um, uh, it's www.craftstudy.org. Um, it's got a beautiful animation which we won't watch all of it, we'll watch a couple of seconds while I select tea. The craft study is trying to find out the best way to treat children who have broken their arm and the bones have moved out of place. The study is comparing the two most common treatments used throughout the UK. One treatment is to put the arm in a plaster cast for four to six weeks. There is evidence that children's bones will naturally grow straight, though their arm may look a little bent for a few months, which can be distressing to some parents or children. Healing may take longer, and in rare cases, an operation may be required. The other treatment is to put the bones back into the right position first before putting the arm in a plaster cast. Children will be sedated or given a general anaesthetic so they can't feel anything. Sometimes a cut needs to be made in the arm to insert plates or wires to hold the bones in position. Occasionally, the bones may move out of place or there may be an infection. Both may require further treatment. In the craft study, half the children will have their broken bones straightened naturally. So both options in the video sound pretty hideous. Um, so, uh, so, so, and you have to remember that those videos go through panels and panels and panels and panels of parents. Um, and, and there's loads and loads of iterations to make sure that each intervention sounds exactly the same. And what's really interesting from craft so far is that we kind of thought that, so, so 
we, we kind of thought that parents might not agree because parents um, or, or, or surgeons and parents would just want the arm straightened. But what we've actually learned is that, that clinicians really want to straighten the arm. They're desperate to straighten the arm. But on the whole, parents are pretty chilled. Parents are, are somewhere in the middle. So in the craft study of the people that have declined to be part, half of them have chosen surgery and half have, cho have chosen no surgery. Um, and so, so it's really interesting where, where kind of parents lie on this one. Um, so it's much more a, a clinician problem with ex equipoise rather than a rather than a parent problem. So the plan is about displaced distal radius fractures. So it's about off-ended ones and about Salter Harris II ones. So any form of displacement. So so anything you you think requires manipulation. Um, between four and ten years old, inclusive. No. Um, we're stratifying by the degree of translation. So they're either completely offended or they're not completely offended. And we need at least 200 that are completely offended um, because we're going to answer a separate superiority question uh, within the offended group. So the intervention is about casting. So putting on a cast without GA or sedation. So, so you can put on a cast with some dimorphine. Um, uh, and what we want you to do is just to kind of gently hold the fingers and put on a nice back slab. Um, or put on a nice full cast or whatever you do, um, uh, just by um, holding the fingers uh, uh, and just letting the cast fall on top. Um, the alternative is about conscious sedation. So conscious sedation um, uh, uh, or a general anesthetic plus or minus fixation. So in the trials, some have been plated, some have been wired, lots have just been MUA'd, um, but there's, um, there's lots of kind of variation about what people think is necessary in, in this intervention group. Um, follow up sort of by text message, message uh, and and follow up at the moment's going really really nicely just as it did in force and just as it's doing in science we've just hit 150 um this trials this trials were going really well actually we've got 40 just over 40 in the last month so um so it, it's gone beautifully um uh, and it's really picked up as as one would expect with summer and the lockdown finishing and it's recruiting it's not quite as big as science yet but it's pretty massive it's, it's opening about 40 hospitals uh, we've opened this morning in sherwood forest so uh, so even robin hood's on board this morning so it's cool um oh look it even moves amazing um so that's the craft study um it's beautiful i'm sure you're all going to have questions because it's the one that causes me the, the the most questions um but it's it's really cool it's really exciting and uh, i really believe in it because it's ace uh, and if you subscribe to our newsletters, you get witty news every month. Um, so look, what people told me was going to be impossible isn't impossible. It really is possible. And it's possible because of you guys. Look, we've delivered force. We've done that. We're doing science and we're well on the way. Uh, and we're also now well on the way to craft 150 patients in this what is a really tough study. Um, uh, I think that's pretty cool. And it's even more cool. That, that we've got Starship um, uh, money. So Starship in New Zealand, they've just funded a, a, a ju they've just put some additional money in to be part of the science study. Uh, and in addition, we've just opened this morning, we've just opened Melbourne in Australia uh, as part of the science study. And we're also opening uh, Brisbane and Sydney very soon. So that's kind of cool. And what's even more cool is in the US, the science study and the craft study has been just been funded by the NIH. Um, for a $7 million um, grant in the US to reproduce the science and craft study in North America. And hopefully that will be a really cool collaboration going forwards where we can, we can start to do even tougher trials, but, but hopefully to do them kind of the same trial. Um, so recruiting within the UK, Australia uh, and the US, because look, ultimately that's how we're going to have to do our, our tougher trauma studies. Um, and perhaps finally, and I promise you this is finally because I keep kind of saying that, um, th there's another trial that we've just had funded, which is about um, distal tibial fractures. So Salter Harris two fractures of the distal tibia, um, uh, and it's about whether we fix them or not. Um, and again, Peruk is involved. So, um, so in Craft, um, Mark's involved um, in, uh, in in this trial. Um, Stuart's involved, um, and so it's got my new favourite acronym. Um, it's even better than science, and that's Odd Socks. So that's the outcomes of displaced distal tibial fractures in kids. Uh, so surgery or cast for kids, which is an amazing acronym. And you can only guess what we're going to be giving away as the, uh, as the incentive to children. Um, it's going to be cool. So look, paediatric trauma uh, research is officially possible. And our UK collaborative is world leading and the whole world is joining in. And guys, it's um, it happened. And I'm really, really grateful. So thank you very much. 
Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dan. That, that's uh, fantastic. Um, there's a, a couple of questions. Uh, can I take them slightly out of order? Have you had any problems with eager orthopedic registrars or SHOs tweaking casts during their application for craft? Because I, I, I can see how that having a potential bias. Oh, Dan, you've frozen on me. Ah, oh, that's a shame. Uh, can I just, is one of the executives, is it me that's frozen or is it Dan? It's I can still hear you, it's Dan, I think. Dan, okay. I wonder if I eject Dan and then I'll, oh no, if I remove him, he won't be able to rejoin. Um, True. Could you just text Dan to let him know he's frozen? Yeah, we'll do. Thanks. Um, Mark, have, has that been a known problem about? Have, do, do you does the study team see pre and post X rays, or do, is an X ray not part of the, the study CRF? The X rays do come through eventually. <clears throat> but there's no, they don't come through immediately. So we're not seeing exactly what's happening at the time. It's not been reported um, as a major issue. I think that the orthopods convinced by the charm and charisma of Mr. Dan Perry have agreed on block to do what they're told. Um, and so is it happening? <sighs> I'm sure it probably is a little bit, but, um, but we're not hearing reports that it's a big issue. Okay, there will be analysis of x-rays, but um, not yet. Um, um, and now it's been in a, another interesting point, which I think uh, Dan's been trailblazing in trying to change practice. Is, is Kraft likely to convince those who are unwilling to participate in a trial, let alone change practice? Because we have had sites which the orthopaedic team have said, no, we're not going to be part of it because we don't believe in it. I think this is one of those things where there's, oh, there you are, Dan's in, I'll let him answer. Um, yeah, I am, um, sorry, I, my, my internet died at a crucial moment in craft. <laughs> <laughs> he always does this in every trial when a difficult question comes up, he disappears. So uh, Mark had taken the question on potential tr trying to mould, uh, even it, regardless of which army you're, you're in. But another question is some of the challenges that teams have had just getting their orthopaedic team on board full stop for a trial, let alone kind of practice. So now we're saying kind of the colleagues in Sunderland were unwilling to participate in craft. What, what's your, I mean, do you think that we, we're just going to need the craft study to complete to demonstrate that it's possible to do this, let alone change practice? Yeah, possibly. So my argument to sites, and I think it's quite a powerful one, is the fact that um, so some some places do this routinely. So so um, places like Nottingham, this isn't new to them. This is what they've been doing for years. Um, and this is quite well established now in the US. So in the UK, we're way more aggressive in the US than the US in treating these these risk fractures, which is kind of weird. Um, and if you look at kind of principles of consent, if you look at Montgomery consent, we should actually be explaining to everyone what all of the options are. Um, and therefore, if you're taking these kids to theatre without explaining that non-operative treatment is a possibility, you're not actually consenting them properly. Um, and so the guys like Sunderland who, who are just taking them and without explaining that, that they're, not, that they're not consenting patients properly. And if anything went wrong with that patient, uh, and when I say goes wrong, so there was a kid in Birmingham who had a wire put in the wrist, the wire got got an infection, uh, they ended up with sepsis, a mitral valve, um, uh, 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 a mitral valve infection. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, I don't, I don't know this stuff, but mitral valve infection, they ended up with mitral valve replacement, all because the, the kid had got a wired wrist. Like it can be a disaster risk, like these simple MUAs and KYs are, aren't completely without problems, 20% get an infection. So, um, so, so I think we have to explain it all to them. And I've got a really nice little interview with a barrister that I send round to um, to everyone about why they should do the craft study. Um, should should there be teams that are unwilling? Ah, cool. it, I mean, is that a publicly available video? Is that something you could share? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. I've, um, yeah, cool. It's it's yeah, it's 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 the, it's there, and it's my it's my number one uh, my number one uh, ammunition. Fantastic. Um, just in the 
we're, we do have a, a schedule and time, so I'm probably going to have to move on. But, but as always, Dan, thank you uh, so much for your uh, sharing your knowledge, but also your enthusiasm. Uh, it, it, it's always greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll catch up soon. Yeah, you're very welcome. And thank you so much. I do appreciate everyone's help. Really, really grateful. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. Uh, next on to uh, uh, trainee member, Kenne, who is going to be talking about what we're doing at the moment in Faruqi. Over to you, Kenne. Yeah, thanks. I'll just share my screen now. Yeah, um, can, you, can you see my screen? Yeah, it's working well. All right, that's fine. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Kenne. Um, thanks for um, the introduction, um, Dan, um, Damian. Um, I will be walking us through um, what we've been, what, what we are actually doing currently uh, with um, Peruki. Um, understandably, um, the, um, some of the studies have been slowed up by the pandemic, whereas the pandemic has actually inspired um, the advent of other studies. Um, so um, the crisis, I wouldn't talk too much about this because um, this has been talked about by Rob extensively. Um, Dan just gave us a talk on craft and science study, which is ongoing across the UK. Um, Stuart will talk to us about um, those RCT with methoxyfluorine um, shortly. And Damian will give us a talk on this um, multi-center um, observational study on um, Bronx Start. And whilst um, Chris has given us a talk on the challenges um, regarding the um, travel fever study. So moving on to the dimple study. Um, so this is um, the diabetes um, in children and young people presenting to the ED during the, um, the COVID pandemic. This study is led by Caroline von Money um, from London. Um, so um, there was an unusual pattern of presentation of unwell children with DKA during the first wave of the pandemic. Um, so this inspired the study, and I think um, I'm sure we'll be looking forward to the findings from this study. Um, sites are open, and some data collection um, already kicked off. Approximately half the site in the UK and two um, sites in Ireland um, is um, are ongoing at the moment. Um, the episode study, um, Rude um, Nijman is involved with this study. Um, so Peruki is involved with episode study. Um, the study is led by the episode study steering group in collaboration with USEM and the REPM um, network. So this is essentially an observational cohort study to provide evidence for the alleged reduction in the numbers of children presenting to the EDs across Europe during the pandemic. And they also aim to assess the timeliness of presentation to the ED um, to um, the care of acutely unwell children and monitor the emerging COVID-related diseases like the, um, the very popular PIMS TF. Um, at, currently, at least 18 countries um, all over Europe are participating with um, 40 sites and five sites in the UK. Um, Rude presented the preliminary findings um, at the RCPCH a few weeks ago, and um, episode two um, has kicked off as well. So, um, exciting study. Um, the vocal study um, led by Muriel in Alder Hayes, Liverpool, um, looking at the variability of childhood age of management. Um, is a prospective observational study that would explore the epidemiology of children with a traumatic limp that present to the EDs and look at the variations in treatment and um, investigations. Um, so the study um, successfully um, secured um, an RCM grant, which is good. And this will be an exciting study for PEM trainees who will be leading at local sites. So I'm personally excited about this study. Um, the FIDO is the Febrile Infants Diagnostic Assessment and Outcome Study led by Tom Waterfield. This study is like a sequel to the PIC study. Um, it's a multi-center prospective study to determine and validate um, clinical practice guideline for the assessment and management of febrile infants um, under the age of 90 days, which we understand is quite a very tricky age group. Um, so the feasibility work was presented at the RCPCH a few weeks ago and um, won the Joanne Robson APM Prize. It's excellent. Um, and Emergency Medicine SPRO um, Etimbok um, in Ireland is um, will be working on this project um, as his PhD. And he was successful in getting our chem funding, which is very good. Um, this um, per study is um, it was a survey cross network and, and Peruki um, actually um, was a very strong collaborator of this study to look at the IV magnesium sulfate in children and um, with 
at asthma and looking at the um, pattern of practice um, across the world, essentially. And the pain study, um, which is a parent study, and Peruki is a strong collaborator um, that was looking at interception and analgesic. Um, currently, um, this study is in its data analysis phase, and we are hoping to um, report the findings later on in the year. And other studies, um, the Curly study, um, which Stuart will talk to us about, and the UTI-related study, um, and cephalexin duration for UTIs in children. The magnet ingestion surveillance study is led by Shrook in all the haze. Um, this is a surveillance study to describe the epidemiology of magnet ingestions presented to the emergency department. And um, this is different from the BFC, BF, B, BPSU um, case eligibility. So we are hoping to um, um, explore um, what happens with the student when they attend the emergency department and the um, children's assessment unit. Sorry, and the bottom battery surveillance study will be led by Bob Basu, and it's also an observational study to determine the incidence and epidemiology and outcome of bottom battery ingestion presenting to the emergency department. And last but not the least, the pop school survey um, led by Danny Hall in Ireland, um, looking at the sedation, sedation survey and currently being written up and some abstract submitted for the forthcoming RKM conference in the next few months. Um, I think this is a whistleblower of um, the studies we are currently doing, and I'll hand you back over to Damien. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kenne, for that. I mean, it just shows you the amount of work that is uh, ongoing at the moment, um, which is which is really exciting to see. Um, and we've got this uh, a, a, a lots of phases of work so studies that are just starting or studies that have just completed studies being uh, written up etc um i i'm not sure if there's any particular questions on that or if anyone wants to seek clarification uh, mark yeah can i just put in a word on the button batteries work at the minute other stuff is is further off. Uh, I think Bob is somewhere on the line as well. Uh, but many of you will have seen that the BPSU element of this went live a few months ago. Um, so that's very much focused on kids who are admitted to hospital after a button battery ingestion. Um, you'll also have seen last week that it's in the news again uh, with another death from a button battery ingestion in a child. Um, the good news is, is that after having to unblock several layers of research governance for the Peruki bit of this, so to be able to include kids who are discharged from the emergency department as well as those who are admitted, we're almost at the end of that journey now. So Bob is chasing that through with the HRA, making sure that the last of the amendments come through. So we're hoping that this will be going live across Peruki imminently. Uh, all approvals just pending these last amendments are in place. We've got CAG approval for identifiers to be submitted. It will be non-consenting. It is adopted onto the portfolio because Bob won the Peter Tizard bursary through the BPSU and I'd highly recommend others having a look at that as well. It gives you a year of free data entry onto the BPSU and makes you eligible for um, portfolio adoption. Um, so I hope that over the next couple of weeks you will get a missive from the button battery study team outlining exactly how to get involved and be more inclusive of patients coming through the department after a button battery ingestion, not just including those ones that, that end up getting admitted. Uh, thank you for your patience with this one. I know it has dragged on for a while. Um, another one that was affected by the pandemic, but we're hopefully nearly there now. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, <coughs> Ellen, I saw you, you put a hand up and it's gone down. I presume that was accidental. Or did, if there's a specific question, uh, maybe stick it in the chat. Um, Okie dokie, brilliant. So we will uh, move on now. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. So hopefully you can all see a, a slide set. So what I've taken here is this is the training slide set um, for the, the Bronx Start study. So if you are a, 
a site you should have seen this and be sharing it with your rec recruiters as you go for, for study adoption. Um, so Brunkstart is essentially looking at how bronchiolitis is, has changed and the reasons for that um, is that because of the, uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, the epidemiological kind of characteristics of RSV seem to have, to have changed. Um, and that we essentially saw no RSV last winter. Um, but more importantly, there is data from other countries, in particular Australia, um, that there was a huge seasonal or unseasonal peak. So the, especially the Western Australians were bathing in temperatures of 37 to 40 degrees, but were still seeing RSV positive cases in their emergency departments. Um, and that there is also some evidence that the, the, the peaks can not only be out of season, but they can also be modulated. So in Australia, it was much bigger than it normally is in winter, albeit milder cases, whereas in France, they had a, an out of season spike, but it wasn't as big as you'd normally expect in their seasons. So this may well be to do to the fact that there are um, different lockdowns, different social structures, et cetera, et cetera. We essentially don't know. Um, but what we do know is something has changed in virtually every country that has reported it. But the advantage we have in the UK is that most other countries have had to report retrospectively. They've not been able to gather data in real time. Um, and as RSV cases start in the UK, we've been given an opportunity to do some prospective work. And I think this is really important because we can then look without bias at whether uh, bronchiolitis will affect an older age group. Will it be more severe? Will there be geographical spread? I mean, sadly, we've probably already missed a bit of the geographical spread because I gather cases are rising in, in the Northwest and there has been a PICU admission in the Southwest. Um, but I think we are as close as possible to being the, uh, at the beginning of this. And as well as just simple research, it is also going to be the case that we may actually be able to help with service planning, uh, depending on how severe uh, the pandemic is, or the, 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 the surges. So protocol is pretty simple. What we're trying to do is recruit less than two-year-olds with clinical features of bronchiolitis or acute lower respiratory tract infection or a first episode of acute viral weeds. The reason we're doing that is each of those groups may have RSV when we don't normally think it does. So for example, it may be this winter, we see lots of first presentation wheezers who we'd normally have not considered RSV at all and just treated well salbutamol, but we may find out they're RSV positive, which is why they are part of the inclusion criteria. Um, um, and the, the, that will create some churn in terms of our result reporting because what we are doing is we're including admissions and discharges, but we're not going to be doing swabs per se on discharges. So we'll probably never really know <coughs> for, the, for the alerties and acute VAROEs, but at least we will be recording their outcomes at seven days. And if they truly are readmitted, and then get tested and do have an RSV, we'd find that. So hopefully we will find a signal uh, amongst all those noise. The thing that is slightly different about this study, and we have been challenged about this already, this is a study that is collating routine collected data. And for that reason, we're not having to go for a kind of a, a CAG amendment. We've not had ethics to do consent. Um, and this is simple routine data. But people ask you, but we don't routinely take a travel history in our children. Well, to be honest, you probably should do. Um, and if you go back to medical school, as any infection disease of which RSV is, which flu is, kind of common colds, they are infectious, we should actually be asking families, have you had any recent foreign travel um, and questions on nursery attendance in terms of case mis uh, mixing? So we should be answering these questions. And there is a YouTube link below uh, that I recorded a quick session with Liz Whitaker about the background behind taking a travel history and why they're so important. We're collating data through REDCap, um, and we've become uh, really successful at this. Um, and uh, kind of Mark, I think, is probably going to become an inter international professor in the use of REDCap as a means of improving uh, research, such as his prowess now and ninja skills. So we have a, a really great setup um, in that the, uh, the 
the case will be collected by a clinician or research nurse at the time. Um, we're hoping that the COF1, the first entry into REDCap, is done as close to real time as possible because you get the better uh, data that way. But when you fill in the inclusion criteria, it, um, it automatically generates your uh, study number. You link that study number um, locally to the uh, patient S number and date of birth. So you can follow up the patient for COF2. And Mark has created a QR code and we've had, we have a short link to be e easy uh, make it easy to find uh, the, the red cap link. Um, and the only information is really the patient demographics, any POC results, uh, if you point of care, have you treatment given and decision to admit discharge. Um, and then uh, the, the key thing about this is the details of treatments included in the CRF should be at the, uh, the at the moment that they are in the ED or assessment unit before the decision admit to us was made. The reason we're doing that is because let's say for whatever reason you spend 24 hours in your emergency department, it may well be that you get loads of interventions and tests in the emergency department when you should have done what you should have already gone to the ward. So please, this is, you see the patient, you sort them out as you would do in an ED, and the moment you think they should have gone to the ward is when you, you close that CRF. Um, as I said, we've got ethical approval granted, it's adopted onto the portfolio, and you follow local R&D processes uh, at each site. Um, so that is it in a nutshell. We already know some sites are, uh, have been given permission to start, um, and I gather from Mark that it may well be that Leicester have recruited the first station, patient this morning. Um, I've not had a chance to, to look yet. So that is... Uh, bon start. Mark has been monitoring the chat for me. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. Nothing yet, Damien, but uh, everybody, please do speak up. I know that loads of you are in the setup phase and permissions phase and things like that. Stuart's got his video on. That usually means there's a question coming. No, uh, he's just ready for the next one. I said, Seb's got his hand up, though. <laughs> Seb, go ahead. Hi, it's Seb in Salisbury. Um, can I just ask about retrospectively entering? Because for the last couple of months, we've been keeping tabs. We haven't had any RSV locally yet, but we've had a few eligible patients, probably about 15. How would you like us to enter those? So this is a good question. So we didn't, we haven't got permission from a recruitment point of view to collect those patients so that they can, they can't get you recruit because the study has only just started. Um, uh, but we and Mark, just make sure I've not got this wrong. If, if you you those patients can be stuck on the Redcap database as long as the research whoever your re, local research lead doesn't uh, put them as as accrual. Um, the thing to say though is lots of people have asked about whether you can do the whole study retrospectively. We are really keen that that you you don't set out just to do everything retrospectively that there needs to be an effort made by the study sites to collect as much data in real time as possible. We've been really fortunate to get ethics derogation and non-consent. And I think the price we pay for that is doing everything we can to collect in real time. Um, apart from this, the, uh, that you were, um, uh, the, the patients who you couldn't have recruited. Hope that makes sense, sir. So Damien, just to clarify, I think that's really clear on the, what do I do if I've got a patient in front of me? It's submit the data live, if humanly possible, uh, and the form should take, we think for a simple case under a minute, for a more complex case between one and two minutes. Um, and then it's in, and lots of places are setting up um, research nurse teams behind the scenes. Initially, the, the plan was for the CRF2 to go to the enrolling clinician, but now that we've got portfolio adoption lots of sites have been able to get research nurse support so we're able to divert all follow-up emails to a central team and we can even potentially give that central team red cap access so that they can monitor uh, progress and completion in the background so we want to avoid retrospective data collection for those kids from this point onwards because we know that we document positives really well in the notes and while we may ask lots of questions we don't always document the negatives as well in the notes for things such as travel history. Damien just to clarify the other element of that so when we did the initiation video we asked sites to keep an eye on patients coming through the doors and try and keep a log of, of those 
are we now expected as sites to upload all those patients onto the onto REDCap? And the answer is yes, we can. But are you expecting as chief investigator that we go back to those logs that we've kept and upload all the details for every patient, or do you just want the numbers from those? Oh yeah, so I mean that's a good question. Um, I, I mean I'd argue if we if if people are able to get the detail for those then they should upload them because it, it, I think it would be useful for us as a study to know what was coming through the doors. What I appreciate though, is that might be quite a task because you're just adding to your data trawl. Um, and so if, if we can personally be told the numbers you had, um, but let us know if you're planning to update them onto REDCap or not. Does that make sense, Mark? Yeah, that's good. So we can get that instruction out to our leads. We've got another question from, uh, so, uh, sorry, just to close that one off, I'll come back to Sylvester in a little minute, just because Niall's asked a question on a similar theme. Does the protocol, and I guess all the approvals, allow for retrospective data collection? Um, so, I guess that will depend partly on what you've marked as the study opening date. Yeah, so it does, so it does for, because we, we, so lots of people are now complaining that there's a, the, the study opening date is wrong on the OID, it's because we tried to get this through so early. Uh, so that you can put the, uh, the the retrospective stuff through from when we said, but also that the protocol does allow for ongoing retrospective data collection as well. Great. Sylvester, uh, on approvals. Uh, Damien, how did you manage to not have to fill in a CAG? Um, so there are two reasons for this. One is because I filled in all the paperwork um, and no one challenged me on it. Um, but the, the more important reason is that the, the, the specific design of this study is that we are collecting normally identified patient information, but that the red cap is not taking any patient identifiable information, and that is being linked to at a local level. Um, and so under the, 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 there's nothing about this which can breach patient's confidentiality, basically is the way I understand it, and the way the HLA have approved it. So it's that separation, I guess, of patient identifier and study ID, uh, which the local sites hold rather than anything else. I, I mean, I, I probably shouldn't need to say this, just, just to be crystal clear though, is that each of the site is going to have some information which has the study site number, uh, the, the study, your local study number on it and some patient detail. That is to remain in your hospital, don't take that out of the hospital. That would not be a good thing to do. Uh, a question from Rachel, uh, which probably reflects the anxiety a lot of a lot of us at the minute. Um, it's getting busier and there is a risk that we could lose some patients. So in terms of case ascertainment, are you expecting site leads to go back and ensure that we're not missing cases? Yes, yeah, so one of the things, and this is why I love uh, so I'm just putting the travel history up because someone's asked me to <laughs> uh, via a direct message. Um, but so one of the things I like working collaboratively is we worked on the CRF for ages. And then literally 24 hours before we were going to go live, Mark questions me and goes, should we be splitting up how we're collecting the bronchiolitis, lower respiratory tract infection and first presentation wheeze because we'd lump them together. We have now separated that into three. So you'll know who you've recruited because you think they've got bronchiolitis, who's alerty and who is um, first presentation via wheeze. One of the things that I think we are going to need to do because all of you should have good coding systems for your, your bronchiolitis patients. I think as we get to horrendous numbers, it's likely that we will miss cases. But it would be good that we make sure we try and capture those patients coded as at least as bronchiolitis and that you'll be able to, to find those patients and make sure you've not missed them locally. Um, now, I, I don't want to go on public record of saying that you're allowed to miss the other cases because that's not what this research or the protocol allows for. But actually, I think there is a way in the study design for you to at least concentrate when it gets too busy to take stuff to at least make sure that we, we know your rate of uh, including the bronchiolitis patients. Does that make sense? I hope I've not confused anyone there. No, I think as well, there is an acceptance of this type of work 
um, and certainly we saw this with the head injury work that we did in Australia, there is an acceptance that you will miss a proportion of patients in a study like this. And the kind of the informal rule of thumb, I'm not even going to say what it is, but you know, as long as you're getting most of them, um, and ideally as high as possible, uh, but it is perceived as a real risk. Um, I got cut off there for a minute, but I did notice from Sally a question um, came through just before I disappeared. Um, how is this different to what is being collected by Public Health England? Yeah, so so we're, we're going to hopefully be working uh, closely with Public Health England. So Public Health England are collecting in a number of sites RF PCR positive patients. They will be able to tell us in real time on a weekly basis how many RSV patients there are out there, which is really important uh, and because we'll know as numbers start to go up what the wave looks like. What PHE can't tell us at all is what, what those patients are like, where they've been, what they're going to, et cetera, so that we can marry up their data with data on actually how many of these patients are being coded as bronchiolitis but not being admitted. How many of those who are coded as having bronchiolitis are being admitted and are positive and what their outcome is? Because we know from previous data and that there's fairly robust evidence on what proportion of patients should stay in a community, will need admission and will need ICU. And there is a theory that RSV this year may be different. And the only way that we can work that out and announce to the whole health system in real time about whether it's going to be more or less acute is through this particular study. Um, and that's really cool, isn't it? Because, you know, that real time side of things, um, I know Damien, you and Thomas are working on coming up with a dashboard that everybody will be able to access to track, you know, this kind of informal geographic spread that we normally see uh, with some sites getting hit before others. Uh, Patrick, just to clarify that question. So all the children up until now that you've been logging, yes, you can log them on to REDCap as per prospective data collection. Damien, I think Patrick's right in saying that they would yeah. not point towards accrual, is that correct? Damien's disappeared. Sorry, literally classic, classic Zoom error of being DPD man arrives. You, could, you couldn't write this. Um, sorry. Uh, so um, I've gone all red now. Uh, the uh, what was it? The question was to no, it's just, it's, it's, uh, just clarifying that retrospective data again that people have been logging. Did you say that it will not count towards accrual? Yeah. So you you, you, ca you can't count to accrual before your study state has started. Great. So sorry we about that. But that but it, we, we have to play by the rules. Yeah. Cool. Uh, now, were there any questions that I missed while I was offline? Shove your hand up, switch your video on. Excellent. You've brought us in right on time for Stuart Hartswan's update. Uh, and the plethora of studies that he's running at the minute. So I'll go mute. Stuart and Damien, back to you guys. I'm just going to answer, Sally's just asked about what's the latest to start. Um, keep, keep going, try and start, keep us updated. Clearly, if it's January 2022, it's a non-starter, uh, but maybe later this summer, even early autumn, might be okay. Uh, ping me an email, Sally. Um, Stuart, uh, over to you. Cheers, Damien. Just checking, you can see my uh, slides now, yeah? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to be just updating on three studies that I'm involved in. One of them, which is currently active, and two, which are at the funding application stage and which we're crossing everything that we do eventually get funding for and will become active rookie studies. So the first study is Magpie. Um, Chris Bird earlier apologised for how long Travel Fever had been running. My, this is nothing compared to Magpie. It's been going on for ages. So it's been a really tricky study um, to complete, partly because of the type of patients that we need and how difficult recruitment has been, partly because of changes in circumstances. It's a study that's very dependent on research nurses screening patients. And understandably, that availability of research nurses changes at some sites. So we've had to sadly lose some sites because they just weren't able to continue to provide um, that screening opportunity. 
but there have also been some issues um, which we've learned lots of lessons from in terms of working with industry, working with CROs. There's been um, a massive amount of staff turnover um, for this study. We've had about four different project uh, leads from um, Acuvia. Sites have had gone through five or six CRAs, so it's been a real toughie. But anyway, I'm just going to update you on where we are. For the benefit of people who maybe haven't heard about this study before, what we're essentially trying to do is to get an extension in the uh, license for this drug Penthrox so that we can use it in paediatric patients. So it is licensed at the moment in the UK and in Ireland for adult patients in the context of trauma, but we need a paediatric license and therefore we're obliged to do a regulatory study which has to be placebo um, controlled and which has to generate efficacy and safety data. And the reason why we want to do this is we think that Penthrox would be a great drug to have available to us because it's very easy to administer, it's patient administrated, it gives rapid analgesia, it's got very few side effects and it's not a controlled drug. It's brilliant for in the back of ambulances, it's brilliant for mass casualty events. Um, so what we're aiming to do is to recruit kids between six and 18 years of age who come to our EDs with trauma that's got a um, pain score roughly equivalent to six to eight. So the kind of the moderate to lower end of severe pain scales. Um, the challenge is that they have to understand the pain scales, which can be a bit challenging when you get down to the younger kids and they have to be analgesic naive. So patients with the right type of injury who understand the pain scales, who haven't already had paracetamol and ibuprofen means that you have to screen a lot of patients to get eligible ones. And in total, we've got to recruit 222, and half of them will receive um, an inhaler that's filled with Penthrox, and half of them will receive an inhaler that's filled with saline. And what we then do is we monitor their pain over time, and the primary outcome is the change from baseline until 15 minutes after commencement of the treatment. And we hope to show that the half of the kids who get the, um, the Penthrox will have a bigger drop in their pain scores than the other half who've been receiving saline. Um, so this is how we're doing. We've recruited 169 patients. We've got 53 to go. Um, we've made a few changes to the protocol in that, whereas previously we had quite large numbers of children who had to be in the lower age cohorts for the regulators, we've pleaded to them to reduce that number because they are really, really tricky to, to, to recruit. Um, and, and they've relaxed uh, the rules a little bit on that, which means we don't have to have quite so many of the young ones. Um, these are the sites that are currently active. Um, we're bringing on an eighth site soon in Kingston. Um, and massive thanks to the four sites that you can see there who previously contributed to this study. Um, if this is the first you've heard of this um, and you're interested, unfortunately, participation is very much uh, dictated by funding from the sponsor. And at, moment, at the moment, there's no appetite for any new sites because we've only recently taken on Leicester and we've got Kingston coming on board. But of course, if this should change, I'll, I'll send it, an email out through the full Peruki network to invite further um, participation. But we're hoping that by the end of this year, start of 2022, we should be there. Um, if it's okay, I'll take uh, questions for the three different studies all at the end. So um, the next study that I want to talk about is the uh, Keflexin for UTI studies. Um, we've got a pretty good uh, acronym. This is going to be the CURLY trial. Um, and what we're aiming to do is to identify what the optimal duration of Keflexin is for kids with febrile UTIs. The reason for doing this is that the guidelines that we have around the world are very vague. So NICE, for this particular indication, recommends anywhere between seven and 10 days. In America, they go as far as saying you should be treating for 14 days. Um, Cochrane reviews looking at UTIs and febrile UTIs and pyelonephritis identify that this really is an area where we don't have adequate data from RCTs. So everyone's just been guessing as to what we should be doing without real strong um, evidence. And that contrasts from quite credible evidence when you're dealing with lower UTIs, so, so cystitis uh, in effect, where there is you know, good quality RCTs to support the duration that we should be um, using. So why do this trial? Um, well, firstly, there is a gap. We don't know the answer. But you know, if we can show that we could give shorter courses of antibiotics, 
we might get better patient compliance, we might get reduced antibiotic side effects, it'd be great for kids when they're going back to nursery and school and in terms of family dynamics, it can be challenging sometimes when kids are having to take antibiotics three or four times a day. Uh, but crucially for the funding bit that we're going on, um, we're going down an antimicrobial route. You know, we're saying that you know, we want to do everything we can possibly be doing to reduce durations of antibiotics, to minimize you know, the selection of uh, multidrug resistant bacteria. And, and just on that topic, um, some data that we've got uh, both nationally and also from the uh, Peruki feasibility work that many of you contributed to, uh, massive thanks for that. Um, trimethoprim resistance at the moment for E. coli is about 30%. And that's why if you look at the NICE recommendations, they've now changed that first line should be um, cephalexin for febrile UTIs. But because of ESBLs, which often coincide with other multidrug resistance mechanisms, we're now getting to the point where even for cephalexin, the resistance rates of E. coli is approaching 10%. So you know, we're getting close to a situation where we're going to run out of antibiotics to treat you know, a very, very common problem. So anything we can be doing to, to reduce the emergence of things like ESBL you know, is to be, uh, to be welcomed. So yeah, as I said, um, many sites took part in a um, feasibility assessment. It helped me to understand what you guys are all doing, how you're treating these patients, whether you're following them up, how long you're treating them for. And also you gave me some really, really helpful feedback about the type of study that I was proposing and what you felt would work well at your sites. Because of that, we came up with this uh, research question. So in, a, in this group of children with a clinical diagnosis of febrile UTI, what is the optimal duration of oral cephalexin? So the proposal is that we're going to recruit children from three months of age up to 11 years who have got a clinical diagnosis of suspected febrile UTI, so um, an upper tract infection, and the clinician who's managing these patients feels that they should be treated with oral cephalexin. What will then happen is that they'll be randomized to one of five arms with a shortest duration of three days and a longest duration of 10 days. And we're using a, a really exciting uh, trial design, um, which hasn't really been um, applied to many actual RCTs yet. It's more of a, of a concept about the best way to determine duration of therapy. Rather than the traditional two-arm approach where you've got to arbitrarily pick two different durations and show that either they're equivalent or that one is superior, this design randomizes to multiple different durations and allows you to then draw a curve of duration against efficacy or cure. And then subsequently, you can decide what you feel your cutoff should be for you know, an acceptable cure rate. And you can determine from that the precise number of um, days that seems to correspond to your uh, optimal uh, duration. So the primary outcome that we're going to be um, using is a composite outcome. So children whose urine has become sterile, whose fever has gone away, and who haven't received any other additional antibiotics from GP walk-in centre or a return to an ED. And this is going to be the, the schema. So the, the follow-up is going to be fixed around day 17, which will be one visit back to the emergency department. Um, and that was acceptable by parents um, because of the importance for them that children who are getting shorter durations than is currently standard, they felt it would be important for there to be some element of additional follow-up and monitoring compared to what is standard. All of the other follow-ups uh, will be done remotely uh, using text messaging and a home collection of urines. So, yes, we've, uh, we've submitted this to a specific HTA bid for studies looking at short versus long duration of antibiotics. The stage one application is now finally in, and I'm expecting to hear the outcome of that towards the end of this month, the start of August, crossing everything that we get shortlisted. And if we are, then this timeline just gives you a rough idea of where we're going to be after you know, applying for a stage two application and seeing what they think. Um, so we'll be, we'll be looking to start recruitment towards the middle of 2023 if we are successful. And then finally, um, another study that I have just been a collaborator on from the PEM world is another orthopedic study uh, that Tim from Oxford is leading on, um, which is trying to understand the role of MRI and ultrasound in osteomyelitis. So this is called the uh, PICBONE study. 
um, and it comes from a funding uh, uh, bid from the HTA specifically for a study to look at the sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound and MRI in osteomyelitis. And what we have done in our bid is try to explain that in pediatric emergency practice, osteomyelitis and septic arthritis are really one condition. Um, and that's how we manage them. And we've also tried to say that whilst knowing the specificity and sensitivity of these two tests is interesting and no doubt useful, what would be far more helpful for um, our, our specialty and for orthopedics is to have a clinical algorithm so that we understand how these investigations would fit into um, a treatment clinical practice algorithm um, for this type of presentation. But that's what we've done. Um, so we are aiming to firstly keep the HTA happy in answering the question that they want in determining the sensitivity and specificity of these two investigations. But secondarily, what I think we would all like is to develop a, a clinical algorithm uh, to help practitioners for children who are presenting with a traumatic limb. So the patient population um, for this study would be um, children up to the age of 15 years of age, where there is a clinical suspicion of any osteoarticular infection, so osteomyelitis or septic arthritis, and whose symptom duration has been less than two weeks. And the study is designed that there'll be a retrospective component, um, which will allow us to determine the diagnostic accuracy of the two radiological investigations. And for that, we need about 6,000 patients. And then there'll be a, an external validation of the algorithm, um, which will require about uh, 1,500 patients. And we estimate that about 33 uh, Peruki sites would be needed to, to generate the, this patient number. And alongside these two components would be a qualitative aspect of the study where parents, families and healthcare workers will be asked a bit more about ultrasound and about MR and the implications of those and how acceptable these two investigations would be within an algorithm framework. Um, so we're a little bit further ahead with this bid um, in that our stage one application was successfully shortlisted. Uh, we're down to the final two. Uh, and we're at the moment, we're just revising the stage two application, which has to be in in the next few weeks. So again, it's another study of watch this space. Hopefully, um, they'll see that this is a great study to fund and we'll be able to utilize um, Peruki in, um, in answering this really important research question. So, so that's it. Magpie, which is a struggle, but which we're going to get there on. And two other studies where hopefully um, we'll get some funding and we'll be able to get back to, to folks in the near future to inquire about participation. Happy to take any questions. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Stuart. Um, I haven't got anything in the chat. I, I do think for, for the last study, um, we'll get the vocal team. Maybe we should just have a quick chat uh, because that I don't know, that's not going to start immediately, but it, it will start kind of end of this year, beginning of next. Um, and there may be some information that comes from that that might be useful for your group and make sure that we're not duplicating anything. Um, so, so we can definitely do that. Um, any questions for Stuart then? I can read one there from, from Niall. Niall's been asking oh, yes. about the concern about potential delay in analgesia. Um, I think this might be a site-specific um, phenomenon. In Birmingham, it hasn't been the case, and it's all very much dependent upon how your screening setup is and how your overall activity is. Um, and COVID has played a part in this, but certainly pre-COVID, you know, when we had a single triage screen for everybody with illness and injury, then it wasn't uncommon in our department that kids would be waiting 40, 50 minutes to see a triage nurse. So at a minimum, the earliest they were going to get any analgesia from our department was often you know, about 50 minutes, an hour. Um, the way that we're working Magpie is that as soon as these patients are registered and they're potentially eligible, they are taken by our research nurse and they have their triage done separately. So they effectively skip the queue. So if they then do decide to participate while they're reading about the information um, and we're preparing the consent and preparing the, the analgesia, by the time they actually receive anything, be it active penthrox or be it rescue analgesia because they were receiving placebo, they're, they're, they're probably no more disadvantaged than they would have been prior to the study. Um, 
I haven't heard any particular concerns from other sites about big issues with delayed analgesia, but absolutely, this was something we had to think about when we were designing in terms of not disadvantaging, children, disadvantaging kids and keeping them in pain uh, for an excessive period of time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, Michael's um, put in a, a, a comment regarding kind of excellent research structures. So, and then, I mean, I think, I think there's, a, there's a wider question here about um, kind of the, the facilitation of research. Um, Michael, did you want to, slightly running over, but we could, we'll pull that back in questions and answers, I'm sure. Did you want to expand upon that point? Um, I, I, the question is relatively simple, um, and, and I think my inclusion at the executive and Baruki should help this to a certain degree, but um, I think just to fulfill um, uh, research across, um, you know, both nations, I'm very conscious that the funding acquisition for drug trials, intervention trials and everything is ex extremely structured and there's rules in that regard um, about how it needs to be, um, you know, um, I suppose, um, delegated to sites within the UK or in the NHS. And I'm just wondering how we as a community can facilitate the same trial being uh, intervention trials being done um, in, in Ireland as well as the UK. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of ideas that I have in mind, but I do think that there probably needs to be high level conversations between sister um, uh, or funders, um, which would be um, in Ireland, the Health Research Board or Science Foundation Ireland. Um, um, and I think that it would be useful in future um, for funding calls to, to consider where it fits under funding calls in Ireland as well, so that we can facilitate I don't think it'll work for everything, but I do think that there will be timing that we'll be able to go for funding simultaneously across both countries, um, which will help implementation of intervention trials in Ireland as well as the Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, Mark, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, so I think it's a great point, and it's one that we've toiled with from the beginning, isn't it? Um, we have had some success, so cap it, we managed to get into Dublin, uh, which is great. Um, and, and that was through a, a separate funding stream. And there's also international, you know, kind of past experience of this. If you look especially to PREDICT, which is the Australasian network. So it covers the NHMRC, which funds the Australian elements. And I forget what the New Zealand um, arm is, but essentially what they do from an early stage is what we're now looking to do is engage both sides of the Tasman Strait, in our case, it's the Irish Sea or just the sea, um, depending on where you live. And, and just, you know, kind of make sure that we're talking to each other at that early stage in development so that we can spot the studies where we're really going to have to run it across both, you know, to make it work or where there is significant benefit to run that across both and have that conversation early so that we can be targeting calls so that as one call, you know, as one application is successful, a contemporaneous call is going into, you know, funders in Ireland, say, at the same time as the NIHR. So I think there's some real learning to be done there. And it would be helpful, I think, to make sure that we you know, stay linked with like a Franz and Stuart out in Predict to make sure that we learn the best that we can from what they do, because they've now got a 15 year track record of success using that model. Uh, and I think that our funding bodies are open to it, especially given that we've kind of unlock that with the CAPA trial um, to making the NIHR happy. So I think there's, there's massive opportunities here uh, and it has to be a focus going forwards and it'd be um, great to see it develop. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I mean, I, I, Michael, these are conversations that we probably need to pick up going forwards, but I, I do think at a high level, if we can knock some heads together, I think in our post-Brexit world, people might be quite excited about the possibility of funding streams that particularly look at collaboration between the UK and Ireland. Um, and that, I, I think there's some opportunity there. Clearly there are some threats, but I think there's a lot of opportunity. And I think that was one of the political points that we had in our mind early on when we started. So for a Horizon 2020 grant, for example, you had to have three countries involved across Europe. 
And, you know, what we were showing that we had a really good track record in Grookey of the UK and Ireland, and all you needed was one other. And what you really needed was one other poor, poor, financially poor system to, um, to join. And Spain was set up as a perfect network in those days. And I think those opportunities, given the news of the last couple of weeks that we're still going to be part of those European calls, provide massive opportunities if we keep developing this track record that we've got of, of delivering on these studies. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I think, yeah, this will be part of prospective conversations and the sooner the better. And yeah, I think the Australian New Zealand experience will be something for us to learn and build on. And you've got a link in there, Mark, so we're all good. <laughs> Brilliant, fantastic. Okay, so I'm now going to invite uh, Shruk uh, to a short presentation on some of the stuff that, that we've got coming in the horizon. And I know we've already discussed a load of studies that are coming, um, but there is more in the bag. Hello, everybody. It's been such an inspiring day, actually, so far. So um, we're just going to talk about um, where we are going. And let me just share my screen. Hold on a minute. Yes, okay. It's GP. I was like, yeah, I did say, I said. Uh, and I'm just going to start the slideshow. Okay. All right, so um, where does the uh, future life of Barika? We've seen some fantastic work that has uh, been done in the past and, and how we kind of actually impact um, uh, kind of national guidance and, and hopefully how we're gonna impact um, with some of the studies kind of, you know, future research and, uh, and um, you know, with these great uh, prospective studies, um, actual, you know, guidance um, as it's happening. Um, but this is a little sample of, um, what's been put forward to Peruki um, of studies that are going to, going to be up and coming, but uh, th there are different stages of, of development and it'll give you a flavour of the kind of ideas that people are having and hopefully actually inspire you all to have your own ideas and um, to give you an understanding of how um, something, uh, a small idea can actually develop into something uh, further. So um, our studies to come, uh, which are almost uh, ready. Uh, we've heard about the vocal study from uh, Mariel uh, Tolhurst-Kuber at um, Alder Hay, um, and that is a, a variability of childhood atraumatic limb management study. It got successful um, ARCHEM funding, uh, which was a really good way of actually utilising a really small pot of money um, to try and get this study um, off the ground. Um, and um, IRS submission is in progress. There next is the asthma care uh, variation. Um, it's a retrospective um, cohort study of um, uh, to establish international practice, um, and that's led by Susanna um, Shu. Um, hold on a minute. Okay, hold on. Right, uh, we discussed the. Um, very briefly about the magnet study. That is a prospective study of magnet ingestion. That's a, um, hopefully going to be a red cap study. Um, and um, there's just been some recently published uh, national guidance about uh, magnet ingestion. Um, so the magnet study, you've, you've probably seen the uh, protocol kind of go through the um, uh, research um, study committee of Peruki. And we've got some good uh, information to be able to kind of develop this a little bit further and adapt it to our current situation. The study lead is Nigel Hall in Southampton, who is a pediatric, um, a professor of pediatric surgery. Um, this slightly links into, um, you know, the button battery um, work, which is uh, linked but a bit separate to the, uh, so button battery is from the BPSU and that is actually currently live. So the magnet one isn't at the moment, but it, hopefully it will be. Um, the Curly trial that we've just heard uh, from about Stuart Hartshorn. Um, so, you know, that's kind of a lot more advanced. It's uh, what we've heard is a randomized control uh, trial of the, um, with this unique way of uh, designing a study um, to look at the length of time of uh, cephalexin use. So um, studies that are being considered 
Um, there's an anaphylaxis registry, so a protocol to establish a registry for children attending emergency departments with anaphylaxis. So that study lead is Paul Turner. There's the intranasal ketamine for sedation, compar comparing uh, various doses of intranasal ketamine to IV ketamine for um, procedural sedation, and the study lead for that is Mark Little. There's a uh, technology use in COVID study, so a study looking uh, to evaluate any change in digital systems or apps following the COVID era. era. And that was on the back of some um, uh, kind of uh, technology use work that uh, Heiko Jane had done. So it's just kind of a little bit more forward moving on an uh, original study with, uh, and original thoughts, which were done uh, several years ago. So something which is a little bit more uh, advanced is the major incidence tri triage study, which is exploring the utility and accuracy of existing major um, incident triage tools. Um, the analysis has been uh, completed um, for the uh, performance accuracy of existing tools using the TARN data. And hopefully in the future, what will happen is that actually Periki will lead on a um, kind of a Delphi consensus stage um, of this work and we'll actually gather some opinions using the usability of the existing um, tools. And this will be um, a really nice way of not only engaging Peruki, but PICS and pre-hospital work. And that's led by um, Jamie uh, Ocello. Um, the RESAP study, which is a device study accessing uh, diagnostic accuracy of smartphone apps for condition uh, diagnosing uh, cough in children. Um, really quite novel, um, and the UK lead on that is Sylvester uh, Gomez. Uh, we've heard about the um, uh, paediatric osteomyelitis imaging study, which I think, um, uh, Stuart, if I'm right in saying it's not actually called Promising anymore. Yeah, this, uh, is, now, this is now pick bone, yeah. Pick bone study, so things that. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's a lot more advanced than, uh, for example, some other studies. But these are all studies in progress, and you can see how diverse the studies that are coming through um, Peruki are. We've heard from Mark and um, from Richard Chin and from Rob Forsyth about um, the studies post-eclipse and what they would look like, um, which are really, really quite exciting in terms of looking at that algorithm and kind of picking it apart a little bit more and seeing what else is out there. The here and now study, so a survey looking at clinical service provision across the Peruki network in line with the Facing the Future standards, which is linking with APEM, which is uh, hopefully we're going to, we, we have been building um, a stronger relationship with APEN in, as you heard from uh, Damien about the uh, the NIHR uh, kind of funding and, and the link with that. So that's that's really, really quite exciting. Um, the inert foreign body ingestion. So um, a surveillance study to describe epidemiology and management of inert foreign body ingestions into the emergency department. Uh, and Niall is leading on that. And um, apologies, apologies to anyone who doesn't support England, but my God, it's coming home, okay? Um, and that is hopefully the future of football. Of, uh, but what I'd like to say is, what future studies would you like to see? And I think I'd like to open it up, if that's all right, to um, so some discussions as to um, what kind of things are we lacking in Peruki? What do we need to develop a little bit further? You know, the studies that uh, you've just seen are a real wide example of um, kind of ideas and systems, um, but maybe we need to have a little look a bit more on, um, you know, children's mental health presentations. There is um, certainly funding calls for children's mental health presentations, and I know that we are seeing a lot more um, mental health uh, problems presenting to the emergency department. Um, COVID has shown us that, um, you know, public health measures are important in that interface between public health and the emergency department. So, you know, are, are there any thoughts that, that we have? Does anyone have any study ideas on, you know, kind of public um, health ideas? And um, uh, maybe a little bit more work on um, health services and systems. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop talking and open up the floor um, to you all to see um, what, what kind of things you guys would like to discuss. I'm going to stop sharing so that we can see you all as well. But it's coming home. Thank you, Shuk. Um, 
excellent. So uh, we have uh, essentially uh, uh, quite a bit of time now to, to, to go through things. Clearly, we don't have to use that all. Um, and I know people will be, it's, it's quite a long call having started at half nine, um, but we are interested in any thoughts, ideas, um, however out the box that they are, or use what Shruk has presented, just an opportunity to go away and have a think about things and maybe get back to us. I think the um, the things that I presented have, have uh, and the work that uh, is kind of in the background going on are things that have just come from an observation or an idea or a, a chat or a discussion and actually turning that into okay let's do a Peruki proposal let's get other people involved let's see what Peruki think um, is, a, is a really important step in actually trying to develop our profession and answer the questions that we face and the problems that we face um, so it, you know it, and it could be something as, as simple but as burdensome as you know um, ingested foreign bodies you know you know how, how, how do we manage that um, all the way to um, you know the here and now um, kind of you know facing the future standards with uh, collaboration with APEM so it's it's a real mix of what we're doing and um, what I would really encourage is that if you do have that question on the shop floor is to actually just kind of pause and say well actually you know does this does this have legs um, let me talk to somebody about it and um, and, and Peruki is a great way of actually um, you know bouncing ideas off and seeing if if something is um, feasible or not. I think you are muted, Damien, if you're saying anything, I can see your lips moving. Uh, stunned everyone into active reflection and thought. Um, and I, I, maybe people just want to uh, kind of extend lunch or kind of uh, crack on back to, to work. Um, we may well kind of call things a quit there then. Um, oh, no, a, a couple of hands. Um, and a video that. Uh, Mike. Um, we've got. Yeah, um, I, uh, I've been uh, plowing away at a couple of, of local research projects here, and, and it's really interesting because um, I've spotted in our clinical practice guidelines that we've developed here in Ireland very specific instances where um, we've completely deviated and done something completely different to any other jurisdiction. Um, and in particular, uh, with reference to pediatric arrhythmias, SVT, um, we have um, a different strategy, including higher doses of things like adenosine and so on that we use. And we have been doing this for 10, 15 years. And um, I'm starting to go back to uh, our clinical practice guidelines, just identifying discrepancies or differences in local practice. Um, it's one of the nice things coming from a different jurisdiction. We have a different way of doing things. Um, but it does seem to me like a great uh, foundation upon which there could be collaboration through Peruki with other institutions comparing uh, similar groups of patients with different management strategies, um, all else being equal, if that's possible. Um, and I think it's it's great uh, opportunity for, for projects like that. Um, and uh, I would propose that I would be doing something like that in the near future. Um, so with that in mind, with our simple, you know, almost audit of, of the outcomes in these patients with respect to cardiac arrhythmias, and it's going to be a local project in the first instance, how soon can I start to get Peruki involved or, or should I start, you know, having discussions immediately? And I'll ask that to Mark or, or Damien, you know, so this is someone starting from the ground up and saying, listen, um, how do I start? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's a, a, a great uh, question. Uh, one of the things that we, we started quite a while ago 
um, and it kind of drops off of the radar. It, it is that open accessibility of the executive to bounce ideas uh, off, which I think should always be there. Um, it reminds me about whether to check the availability of our email addresses on the, on the website, or at least a link to be able to email us um, and ask those things. I think things done earlier are, are so much easier. And I don't, I think there's enough of us now that it, it is really easy to, to bounce a few ideas around. Um, and, and I think that applies to however researched um, experience you are. So, I mean, I, I'm sure from your case, Michael, you, you, you've got years of experience, but there are a few uh, kind of peruki nuances that, that might be useful for you to be aware of. Um, and uh, the same applies to a trainee who may, may never have done any research before. You may not know where to start, um, but there's always advice that can be given. And the key thing is, is that the, especially the executive, hold a lot of organizational memory, especially what's worked and what hasn't worked in the past. So there's a lot, so there's lots of, um, there's lots of studies which you don't see us present and you've seen us present a lot um, that, that, have, uh, that have started and have failed <laughs> and have failed for a variety of reasons. And learning about that is as important as the ones that have been successful. Um, so my suggestion is always actually ping someone an email and go, look, I've had this weird idea. Um, what do you think about this? Um, and we will certainly get back with an idea. Or also, actually, this person had exactly the same thought of you. I'm going to put you in touch with them and see what happens. Mark, I'm, I'm sure you probably want to come in as well. Well, look, I would agree, Damien. Um, earlier, the better. You know, idea stage is absolutely fine. A little bit of development is absolutely fine. I, I think, you know, historically, I mean, other networks that you see which are very professional and academic and things like that, there's always an anxiety that somebody's going to steal your idea. That has not yet happened in Peruki, and I would be mortified if it ever did. You know, everything that happens on these calls is confidential. And, and as Damien says, we're not interested in stealing ideas. We're interested in supporting people um, to develop their own ideas in whatever format that takes. And sometimes with the vagaries of the funding bodies, that means that you almost need to be a junior partner, even though it's your idea. Um, and do a lot of the work to develop that track record so that you become the senior partner on down the line. Certainly that's the process that I've been through and what have you with, with the work that I've done. Um, but bringing it early so that the exec can say, yep, there's an opportunity to do it this way, that way. Somebody else has a similar idea. Let's hook you up. Even if you're going to be the junior partner on their project or they're going to be the junior partner, it just opens the door to that collaboration really, really early. And different people will bring different ideas to it. Different people will bring different elements to it, which is massively important, I think. So, um, yeah, I would say come early, Michael. Thank you. Um, very comprehensive. We'll talk to you later today, eh? Can I, uh, can I just add to that, that, um, you know, Peruki is a, is a great organisation in terms of collaborative um, network. And it started from the ground up. And um, we all kind of know each other. And PEM is quite a small um, specialty. And, and I think that kind of smallness and that closeness is it, it really in our favor. Uh, we might not be the most established um, uh, specialty in terms of um, kind of longevity and kind of um, and, and uh, research history, but we're kind of proving that actually uh, PEM research in the UK is up and coming. Um, and what Peruki brings in, uh, uh, is this um, collaboration and this pooling of expertise that you don't particularly get if you kind of try and work on a project by yourself. Um, I think gone are the days perhaps of single centre uh, work. Um, so this kind of collaborative working, I keep saying collaborative, but uh, it's really the way forward. And what we've shown with all the studies that have been published is that um, there's this rapid element to Peruki that it can it can really bring and push push your idea on. Um, so uh, you know, kind of Peruki is us. You know that there isn't a professor of PEM who sits and has nothing to do with the shop floor and is is looking at all these protocols and stuff like that. It, it's actually us. We're doing the job as well. Um, 
And um, so we know the profession, we know the, um, uh, the, the, the challenges that the profession brings, we know that the challenges that a, a question might bring. And um, we're really keen on developing trainees in the network as well. So if a trainee has an idea, it's about helping them kind of develop and, uh, and kind of go through the, the research uh, questions as well. The form that you fill in um, to submit an idea is quite structured. It's not particularly long, it's quite, it's quite a structured form. And once that's submitted to um, Peruki, you know, we, we kind of go through it and we give um, constructive uh, co comments on um, how to move it forward and, and who else to, as Mark said, who else um, needs to link in. And um, it, it, it's a really nice way of having an idea um, with, you know, a couple of people um, on to say, yeah, I think, you know, this has got legs read this, have a look at this person um, before we actually put it out to the, the whole of the Peruki network. Um, and, you know, I've certainly put things in, had them kind of bounce back, you know, put them in again. Uh, and it's it's a really helpful kind of reflective, um, responsive process that happens. Brilliant. Thanks, Ruk. I, I, I think that's a, a really open way of explaining kind of how we operate. Um, Michelle. Thanks. Um, I just wanted a bit of clarification. Um, apologies if this is something that, that is kind of well known already, but where do you draw the line between scientific research and management? I know there are, there are a few studies and things looking at mental health in, in, in people working in different specialties. And, you know, we've talked about that this morning. So it's not all kind of science clinical type research, but for example, um, I've done quite a bit of work on, on older teenagers and where we look after them and what common practices around the country. And what I've done is an informal kind of ring around an email to find out what everybody's doing and then try to put it together and kind of lost, lost uh, the, um, the impetus really. And it never went anywhere. It was just kind of informal. And I think something like this would, would keep me going a bit more in terms of I've really got to get this written up and submitted somewhere, which is the hurdle I always fall at. Is this, is this um, you know, the right sort of forum for those sorts of, where do you look after 16, 17 year olds? Um, what are your, what's your provision for teenagers in your department? Or is that too management-y and not, not science-y enough? Yeah, so, so Michelle, thank you for that. Um, I, I was interesting, uh, uh, Nadi had also, was gonna ask a question about uh, standardizing safety netting frequent flyers and ED and training of, of staff for mental health presentations. And is that service provision rather than research? The strap line of Peruki is to improve care for children and young people. And anything that we do that does that is within our remit. Um, so so I, I think we should support anything. Now, there is, there is a question about, are we the best resourced and able to do it? Um, and there are other organizations, uh, Association of Pediatric Emergency Medicine, the Royal Colleges, ARCHEM, which also should have an interest, and you might argue in some cases should be leading on that. But I, <coughs> I would hate to feel that something didn't happen because someone thought that it was not Peruki's bag. And I think we should invest ourselves in working up these discussions. And it may be that we need to collaborate closer with other organizations and push it to them to do, but we should certainly not close ourselves down. Um, and, and I'm far more interested, when I started in research, I thought I was going to save the world by delivering a new drug or creating some new intervention. I'm clearly not going to, to do that. And I'm actually far more invested in health services research and how systems work, but it's still research and it's still doing good. Um, so so I, I, I do think that anything goes um, in my opinion. Mark, I saw you put your hand up. I don't know. Yeah, I, so I would I would respond to, to Shelley in the first instance. Look, you know, do you enjoy what we do in Peruki? I can maybe a couple of people nodding, not everybody, okay. I, I, that's the thing, right? Okay. Everybody's really engaged and wants to do this for each other. 
as opposed to trying to go out through somebody like APEM or the Royal College or whoever else, and it's just another email in the inbox, and how can I get rid of this? We get something through Peruki. We really want to answer the question because we care about each other, and it's that growth from the bottom up. I mean, you've been involved pretty much since the beginning, Shelley, and to watch what the lengths that people will go to for something coming through Peruki is hugely inspirational hugely inspirational even some things that we were a bit uncertain of when we we're asking them you know kind of is this something that which is going to put people off it's amazing the response we get and i think that is the key thing is that what you really need for work like that is responsiveness and engagement and people willing to put the time aside and that's what we have in Peruki because it's people coming because they want to be part of something not people being pushed off to be told to do it uh, and i think that just makes such a massive difference and Part of the thing about getting getting any of that work through Peruki is that we will nag you every so often, right? So you will not lose impetus. You will get the G up that says, right, come on, what can we do to help here? What do we need to do to get over the line? Is everybody giving you answers? Do you need help writing it up? How do we do this? And we nag each other as well at an executive level. So it is very much about turning concept to translation at the end of it, which is so hugely important and everybody really buys into. Um, so no, I, I think it's absolutely in our wheelhouse. And interestingly, David James had written a lot of adolescent questions for the here and now um, work which has been done um, and obviously we'll share those with you as well before that goes live so that um, you can get involved in that side of things it may be duplication to what you've got already we hate duplication we love collaboration good can i keep my hand up damien has everybody else had a chance yep i just want to take the opportunity to say thanks for the last three years, reflecting on earlier on, and a huge congratulations to Niall and to Tom, um, to, to their roles within the exec. And I know that they're really gonna drive it forward with Michael joining the exec now as well. And the restructuring, but uh, you know, having, having sat in the chair that you've sat in for the last three years um, and doing it before you, I know it's a huge job and I've watched over the three years as you've put oodles and oodles of time, energy, enthusiasm, dedication, all those buzzwords into it. And I can't let a meeting go by without saying thanks for that in front of the wider uh, membership. I do not have the standard bottle of whiskey to deliver to the stage um, to see you on your way, as they say. But it is a really good opportunity to reflect on what you've achieved. And I mean, I think you know, we, we, we get down and we do the work and we knock all these studies out and we sometimes forget that there are big strategic developments that take place. And I was reflecting on some of the big wins that you've had as the chair. The move with the force study to online recruitment has changed forever how we do research, not just here, but in the rest of the world. You, one of your drivers when you came in was to improve the knowledge translation and seeing that relationship grow with don't forget the bubbles and the bubble wrap and everything else and opening the door to trainees, new consultants alike has been fantastic. Making us grow as a partner with funding bodies, becoming a non-commercial partner of the NIHR, becoming more integrated with APEM and everything we do has been tremendous. Getting Peruki written into the standards for emergency care for young people and children. I mean, wow, you know, kind of to get that in your tenure as chair is fantastic. And your route to research to see you support people like Mariel come through and Tom come through from trainees who were research naive to now having funded studies, formal time, watching that grow has been really, really inspirational. And, and I take my hat off to you and I'm sure everybody else does. Um, it's great that, you know, at the end of your tenure, you go on a high. I'm sure that Bronx Start is gonna be both hugely challenging and hugely informative at the same time, but again, pushes the boundaries of what we can achieve as a network. So um, a huge round of applause and thank you from me as past chair to you, Damien. Really well done, awesome work. Thank you very much, Mark. That, that's ex extremely kind. Um, and uh, I am really um, cognizant of the fact that, that this community continues to grow and be extremely supportive to each other. Um, and I, I go to a number of research meetings and there are few in which you get people wanting to be critically engaged uh, and not make snide comments about what won't work and what, what doesn't work. And there's enough about, about that in academia. Um, and one of the great things about Pruki is there's lots of people here who, do, who just do things because they, they want to improve themselves, they want to improve others and they want to improve things for their, 
uh, patients, um, uh, and that's uh, and that's brilliant. And it, it's great that that continues to, to move on. Uh, so thank you for your kind works, Mark, and, and everyone else. Um, right. Well, with with that, then I think we should probably uh, draw it to a close uh, just before one o'clock. Um, that it's been a, a really great morning. There's a lot to take on board. Um, I think I have managed to record all of it. Uh, so maybe with some editing, I will uh, stick that out somewhere for those who couldn't make it to be able to, to, to shuffle through and, and catch up. Um, but uh, keep well, everyone. Uh, as, as you've seen, there's a load coming through. Um, and we're always keen to, to hear when we send you too much stuff. Uh, but so far, you never have done. Uh, so we'll just continue kind of checking stuff out there. Um, uh, and I look forward to a, a future meeting, uh, maybe, maybe in the autumn. I'll have a chat with our uh, Niall about that. Thanks all.